accept everybody. Yep. Can you hear me, Colette? Got it, James. Okay. Nice I'm going to I'm going to transfer some control to you if you want to. Oh, do you want that? Yeah, I mean, ba basically, this is what we can do, James. I have some brief remarks, okay, that I'm going to make. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start to pass this along to our um, speakers. And I sent you the list, okay? And yeah. I'll just introduce each speaker briefly uh, with, um, you know, their affiliation, basically. Okay, no, that's fine. They know pretty much what they're going to do. Uh, I see a number of the... Um, persons we invited coming into the conference room, as you can see as well, members of my conflict resolution seminar, and then yep. others who've been invited from NYU. So they're all okay. gonna start to come in now, okay? Okay, I'm gonna, well, perfect. So you, you have control, we'll just be on the back end, me and Harvey is here off screen, and we'll, we'll just, we'll keep admitting people as they pop up, but the floor is yours, we're gonna go back live now. Okay, fantastic. So um, you just clue me in. As soon as we go back live, what I'll do is I'll start my brief remarks so we stay on point with the time. Okay. Okay. And that'll be We're great. live. We just started. So you can start Super. whenever Wonderful. you're ready. Thank you so much, James. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Colette Masicelli of the Global Learning Center in New York University. Welcome to this panel session, The Ethics of Personal Data Collection in International Relations, Inclusionism in the Time of COVID-19. Our aim in this session is to listen to various insights from colleagues and to engage in discussion with you about concerns we share pertaining to personal data and the potential conflicts inherent in its collection, aggregation, sale, and uses by governments, universities, and corporations. Before we continue, we collectively wish the organizer of the Personal Data Day Summit, James Felton Keith, a happy 39th birthday, and thank him for including us in this session during the summit. Happy birthday, James! Woo, 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 yoo-hoo! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Our pleasure, our pleasure, our pleasure dear. Yes, happy, uh, happy. Thank you, thanks so much. Everybody, okay. yeah. <laughs> As we prepare an edited volume for publication with Anthem Press, we note that in key texts adopted to teach in the field of international relations, little to no mention is made of the ethics of personal data collection in countries around the globe. As we address this omission in the literature, the observation made by Acharya and Buzan in their volume, The Making of Global International Relations, is noteworthy. And I quote, with the possible exception of the emerging ideology of environmental stewardship, no new ideologies of equivalent weight have come along to reshape international relations, end of quote. This panel session addresses the ethics of personal data collection in international relations by suggesting that in a COVID-19 world, inclusionism, which has already been referenced extensively by our colleague, James Felton Keith, is a new lens through which to study and practice international relations. In addition to its sensitivity to questions of identity, including that of identity in the digital world, which our colleague Kalia Young analyzes in the domains of identity. Inclusionism focuses on the triptych of personal data, global pandemic, and social protests to anchor race and gender with the state in the study of international relations. Inclusionism in this context focuses our attention on ideology, values, and identity in thinking about emerging questions which in our COVID-19 world are becoming increasingly central to the study of international relations. Our session takes place during a time of unprecedented loss of human life around the globe. 
The personal data, which is oftentimes incomplete and misleading, nonetheless reveals the state as deficient and at times negligent in its response to social health care needs. The initial three presentations that follow provide a focus on the issues of personal data in terms of collection and privacy, relating specifically to governments, considering aspects of policy, management, and surveillance. Presentations after a short Q&A period concern issues of data collection and privacy in the context of social science human subjects research. As we reflect on the vocation of the university, in our rapidly changing society. Before a closing Q&A session, we share insights about a much larger critical topic that deserves our full attention, which is the collection, aggregation, and uses of personally identifiable data by corporations, an almost entirely unregulated, unregulated enterprise in most of the world outside Europe. These presentations build individually and collectively on the NYU Bosch workshops, which led to a special issue of Genocide Studies and Prevention, published in 2017, as a cooperative effort bringing together colleagues from the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, led by Nathaniel Raymond, as well as George Mason University, led by Douglas and Yasmin Irvin Erickson. Our concerns then, as now, focus on leadership, leadership to interrupt oppression, as well as the agency of civil society, specifically the potential of bottom-up initiatives to sustain justice. We recognize that it is only one part of our larger initiative to interrupt oppression. The more long-term the more critical imperative is to sustain justice. And in the presentations that follow, we aim to contribute our insights and thoughts on this critical imperative. We begin today with our colleagues from Italy, and I'm just checking our Zoom room, here we are. Professor David Unger from SAIS Europe and Professor Christian Rossi from the University of Cagliari in Sardinia. It is my distinct pleasure to turn the conversation over to David Unger. Please, David, begin. David, I think you're still muted, dear. I'm having Zoom problems. There we are, David, perfect. We have your audio. I see you muted again. Mute. Now you're unmuted. There you go. Okay, good. All right. Um, let me repeat that I wanted to thank you for inviting me here into this important international discussion. Um, I'm here specifically to talk about the Italian experience, the good and the bad of it, and how that relates not only to data privacy, but bottom up as opposed to top down strategies for meeting the, the epidemic. Italy has um, what I consider an undeserved reputation when you read the newspaper of being really getting it wrong in the beginning. I don't, I don't think that's the case, although if you look at the statistics, Italy had the highest caseload in Europe, it had the highest death toll in Europe, but I think that's explained less by problems with Italy's response by the fact that Italy really had to cope with this first. It had to cope with it at a time when we knew much less than we know now, and even now we don't know everything, about the transmission and the treatment of this disease. In that context, I would argue Italy did not do so badly, that the central government in Rome acted relatively quickly and decisively, and after a number of difficult weeks with good results to show. And it really was just a number of weeks. The, the, um, First cases in Italy surfaced at the end of January, and the government in Rome believed on the basis of what everyone knew then, that this was direct transmission from individuals, no community transmission, that it was highly localized and could be treated that way. They discovered otherwise, and by the end of February, a month later, they saw that they had a much larger problem, and then they sprung into action. 
And the good results started to show as early as mid-March. I believe March 19th was the date of peak new cases and it was coming down from there. What did they do? First, they um, put down, um, they isolated areas. They took first the, the localities, the provinces. We have regions in Italy and we have provinces. Provinces are smaller uh, units of the region. They took the affected provinces and they banned movement in and out of them. And then they told people in them to stay home. And they realized it wasn't contained in those provinces uh, or that they hadn't drawn the, line, the lines widely enough. So they extended it in one step and on March 7th to all of Northern Italy with 40% of the population and more than 50% of the GDP. And that only held for 24 hours. The reason that only held for 24 hours was not only medical, it was political and economic. Uh, it seemed to people like the government was dividing the country in half along well-known uh, fracture lines that people were sensitive about North versus South. And it became politically more viable to extend lockdown measures to the whole country. Uh, why, we might ask why uh, Italy was among the first hit. It wasn't just an accident. I think it's to an extent not really appreciated that Northern Italy, which used to be the industrial belt of Italy, in the post-industrial age of globalization has become more the center of financial and uh, managerial administration of global supply chains, which involves a lot of travel. Uh, the, the main airport uh, is, is in Milan, is in the Milan area. And there was a huge amount of international travel to Hubei, uh, to China, spreading it initially. Um, so um, the government announced its lockdowns and how did it do that? First, like most European parliamentary democracies, Italy has constitutional provisions for the executive, in this case, the prime minister, decreeing itself emergency powers. And then these powers after a certain interval of time have to be confirmed by the parliament. This is sort of standard practice in Western Europe. We don't have anything like it in the United States. But on the basis of these decrees, the government was able to act nationwide. Um, but even with these emergency powers, the measures the government took needed local buy-in. They needed local buy-in to be implemented on the ground. They needed local buy-in for people to accept them and follow them. So there was a protracted series of negotiations. There weren't the public negotiations where you could put on the cable TV and watch people negotiate with each other. There were sort of negotiations by media, by political speeches or the rest of it. But the essence of the effort was the government in Rome trying to get the buy-in of the key regions, Lazio where, where Rome is, Campania where Naples is, Lombardia where Milan is, Veneto where the, the, some of the first um, early cases were, Emilia Romagna where my university is, Bologna. And all of these regions have different, I mean, Italy is a recently united country and some would say not still a united country. They have local characteristics. Some are agricultural, some are industrial, some are post-industrial, some depend on tourism, some depend on uh, industry, some depend on transport, and obviously different, the government didn't, wasn't able to do what China, or for that matter, South Korea could do initially, which is shut everything down. The constitution and the politics of the country, the spirit of the country didn't allow that. So it had to make choices of what it was gonna shut down. Is it gonna shut down the bars and the restaurants? Is it gonna shut down the beaches? Is it gonna shut them down and reopen it for tourist season? Is it, what is it gonna do about the ports? What is it gonna do about the cruise business? And this is negotiated. It was negotiated not in an ideally democratic way. It was negotiated between elected regional governments and an elected national government. A footnote here, we'll get back to that elected national government in a minute. But it was, it was, it was um, they were proxies for the people as in a representative democracy. The footnote about the national government is shortly before this, the, um, the, the most recent election in Italy had elected two what are maybe imprecisely called populist parties. The Five Star Movement, which sort of 
leans slightly left, and the Lega, which is based on um, anti-immigrant nationalist, one might even say xenophobic sentiment. There was a clash between these two parties. The Lega, the anti-immigrant party, made a play for total power and lost. So shortly before the emergency hit, the composition of the government was changed in which you had the party that came in first and the party that came in third, but the party that came in second was in opposition. So here you have a government acting by decree with no accountability except retrospectively, not representing a substantial part of the electorate, having to win that consent, but not through a formal process of negotiation. Meanwhile, negotiating with the regions. And then at the regional level, negotiations of the same sort are also taking place. That in this region, Liguria, we have, which is the Riviera, we have a center-right government whose political base is in the tourist industry. The tourist industry is important. It accounts for 16% of the regional GDP, but that leaves the other 84%. And perhaps if a different party was in power, it would have been response, more responsive to a different sector of the economy. Maybe it would have been responsive to school teachers. Maybe it would have been responsive to students. Maybe it would have been responsive to whatever. But the government we had was responsive to the hospitality industry and leaned that way in its negotiations with Rome to get space for the tourist season to reopen somewhat cautiously. The central government negotiated sort of dealt with this rather deftly in order to keep freedom of action, in order to not have a parliamentary revolt, depriving it of the possibility of a decree power. It negotiated the perpetuation of its own national decree power by accommodating the different political needs of the different regions. Within the regions, well, at, at both levels, you have a structure somewhat parallel to the United States, where you have the Trump administration and its scientific uh, advisors, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Birx, whatever. Whether they listen to or not is beside the point. If you look at the United States, you have the same at the state level. Andrew Cuomo makes the political decisions. He has his health commissioner. He has scientific advisors as well. So you had scientific advisors at Rome giving a certain advice. Prime Minister Conti deciding which of that advice he could and could not follow on a political basis based on his negotiations with the regions, and the regions themselves negotiating with their own scientific committees about what they were going to press based on their own constituencies. And finally, all of the measures adopted in our lockdown, which was fairly successful, required public buy-in or they wouldn't have happened. They required people to wear masks. They required people to report for contact tracing. They reported a lot of public buy-in and it was absolutely necessary. And that had to be negotiated too, though it wasn't necessarily negotiated formally. What happened is that uh, if we were having this seminar seven weeks ago, it would be a success story that Italy brought down its caseload 95%, all right? To the point where it had only, I think, 2,000 active cases, which is way down from where it was before. Since uh, the July 30th, that number has increased fourfold. We now have 8,000, we're adding 1,000 more a day. Uh, I'm sorry, we must have 80,000, we're adding 1,000 more a day. Why has that happened? Because somewhere in the negotiations of what could be opened up in the summer, too much travel was permitted and it wasn't all the travel. I mean, two things coincided. First of all, the harvest season, and Italy, like the United States, depends on migrant workers, legal and illegal, for its various harvests. So there's a wink and a nod about people landing from countries where the infection rate is higher and, the, and, and isn't being monitored as well. You had tourism, both incoming and outgoing. The tradition here is, as in most of Europe, the long August holidays, the first part of which is spent abroad. And we have beaches here, but neighboring beaches are more appealing. It's a sort of spring break thing. You go to Spain, you go to Greece, you go to Malta, wherever, and people brought back infection from those places. You also, as we see now, Spain, France, uh, and the UK have much higher rates of infection than Italy. So we have foreign tourists coming here, bringing things across the border. 
And finally, the messaging was, was somehow gotten wrong in that young people got the idea that everything is opening up around us. We're preparing to open schools. The emergency must be over. It must be time to party again. It's summer to do our normal stuff. Signals were sent, which were wrong signals. But even in the context of that, I think Italy has had a more sober, more serious approach. And as the numbers have gone up in Italy, there's been public buy-in again on security measures. There's not push back and our numbers, are, although they're rising, are rising at a lower rate than uh, France and Spain, our neighbors or the UK. I think that um, specific, I, I would have liked the negotiation process to have been more transparent. I would have liked it to go further. There were no meetings, there were no town meetings in this town at which the mayor might have said, on the one hand, to the local community, this is how it affects us, this is how it affects you, this is how you can live within the rules comfortably, and heard from the community, all that's fine, but we need, you know, we have a, a, a boat exposition in September, we need some accommodation, we'll do it outdoors. And then the mayor ideally would channel that one back to the regional, provincial, the regional government and back to Rome. All these people are of different parties. These meetings never took place. It could take place. I would argue if it did take place, you'd have had even more buy-in. But if you look at the countries that have, have the best records, like for example, New Zealand, they've done it because they have high degrees of transparency and civic trust. So um, maybe, I, maybe that's a good place to stop because I've gone on a bit long. Thank you so much, David. And I see our colleague, Professor Christian Rossi, from the University of Calgary in Sardinia has joined us. Christian, I turn it over to you and I would ask you, I am of, of course also the timekeeper, uh, six to seven minutes, please. Thank you so much, Christian. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, I was uh, waiting for the other link and, and then I switched to, to the other. Okay, um, starting from, thank you very much Colette for this invitation and starting from what uh, David said about Italy, uh, we have to say that uh, COVID-19 crisis uh, affected mostly uh, from the political point of view, uh, more probably than from the health point of view, the European Union as an as a international organization. Uh, because as um, people and states are stuck struggling against this disease uh, all over the world, uh, we have seen that the European Union uh, faced a lot of problems in uh, organizing a common um, response to this, uh, this crisis. And uh, I highlighted uh, several problems that the European Union uh, is facing. Uh, one of them is uh, a coordinating response the second one is uh, the fact that there is not uh, um, a political body that can decide for the entire European Union. I mean, there is the Commission, and we have seen that the Commission, the first days uh, of this uh, crisis in March, was a little bit uh, unaware on, on what was uh, happening. Um, I was reading the report of the committees and they were uh, checking what was happening with, all, with no coordination between the European Union and the states. So they were uh, giving um, direct directives to the states without receiving information from the states. And uh, alas, they didn't, they didn't have any information from the states. Uh, nor from the, the secret services that may, uh, may be aware of what was happening outside the European Union. And that, that was a major problem. A second problem is uh, the internal uh, and external coordination of borders in the European Union, because this uh, crisis aff affected mostly uh, the Schengen Principle because the state, states had to close the, the borders one another. So uh, the, the Italy, that was the first state that was affected by, 
uh, by the coronavirus crisis uh, was sealed off and Austria, France and other states started to close the, the borders uh, between them and Italy. Today, we, 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 we are uh, experiencing the opposite because Italy is thinking to close the borders between Italy and other countries because of uh, the, the, the crisis, the increase of cases in, in France, for instance, and uh, then the news of today is that uh, we are probably closing the, the borders with the UK, where the cases are, are increasing, and probably because uh, this Johnson sentence about uh, Italy and, and freedom. So uh, probably that's a, a, a little bit uh, revenge of, uh, of the Italian government. I'm joking, but uh, from the political point of view, it's, it, this is very, very important that we are not uh, in, in, we are not able to, to have a common response in, in Europe. And the second uh, and the third point is uh, the European solidarity, the, the possibility of the European Union of funding a recovery for uh, all the states in emergency. And this solidarity, this lack of solidarity was proved by the frugal states that uh, opposed the, the possibility for Italy, France, Greece, and other states in emergencies, em emergency to have uh, fresh money from the, the European Union uh, without um, giving it um, the possibility of giving it back uh, without a higher rate of interest. Uh, what, what does the future reserve to the European Union? uh it's it is difficult to say uh i am confident because the european union has always had a period of uh nearly breakup uh we have it uh we had we have had it in the in the past we had uh, many many times problems uh of uh, difficult uh, difficult times between uh, the states and the European Union, but uh, after uh, each crisis, uh, the European Union uh, get out uh, stronger than than before, because the, the states sit down and decided what uh, what to do for for the future. Uh, we don't have uh, UK anymore in uh, in the the European Union uh, family. Uh, it seems that we have uh, the frugal uh, that are now uh, posing problems to to the others. But I'm I'm confident that in the future we the common um, idea of a European uh, family would would win anyway because we would find um, a solution. And the uh, solution would be a, a stronger political cooperation and um, a, a, probably a, a body that can decide politically uh, in the European Union between the states what to do for, for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, and now we transition from Italy to Taiwan. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Jasmine Lee, a recent graduate of New York University's Master of Arts Program in International Relations, an author and a journalist uh, working also with the news lens. And Jasmine today will uh, address the response to COVID-19 uh, on the part of Taiwan. Jasmine, welcome. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine. And I'm now living in Taipei, Taiwan. So it's actually right now, it's 1 p.m. right now. So, but it's really my pleasure to be here with you. So um, I actually prepared a slide. So let me share my screen. Um, oh, is it possible for me to? I'm not sure if it's possible to share uh, the screen okay. with slides, dear. Perhaps you That's could okay. just speak to them. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure, of course. So my today's topic is Taiwan's response to COVID-19 from a social constructivist perspective. And um, in my research, I, I separate, there's two part of my two, 
I separate into two parts. The first part I address on the implication of this cut uh, of this COVID nineteen to the cross trade relations, and of course because the cross trade relations this will also has a great implication to the global inclusion. And the second part is um, I talked about the data. Uh, data protection and uh, uh, concerns of data protection in Taiwan's um, COVID response. So let me jump into my first part. So, um, so my my in my previous research, I argue that cross strait conflict has evolved into the conflict of identity. So in my research, I use social constructivist to analyze. Um, to analyze how this COVID nineteen has affect um, has affect Taiwanese identity. So um, right now, Taiwan only have 509 case, confirmed cases, and we were, uh, Taiwan's only 18 miles away from China. So um, we has been, we China, uh, Taiwan has been considered as a global model in, in responding COVID-19 pandemic. And Taiwan's success has rest on a fusion of civic participation, technology, and the vigilance of government and people. And so, because in 2003, Taiwan was hit hard by uh, SARS. I don't know if you know about this uh, epidemic. It's a respiratory epidemic and 11 health workers died in Taiwan during the crisis. So because of this heartbreaking experience, when Taiwan were being informed with the SARS-like pneumonia outbreak in Wuhan, China in last December. Taiwan's of officials and citizens was extremely vigilant. The government, um, they closed the border uh, before there's any um, confirmed cases and they banned export of the surgical mask to ensure mask supply. And technology also does a huge plays a huge role in government's response. For example, in Taiwan, um, they merged the national health database with the uh, immigration and custom database to keep track on people's health condition and allow doctor to see uh, patients' travel history. And those in the community uh, created apps also help complement government's measures. Um, there are some app called face mask, uh, face mask map. So it is a national real time map for every Taiwan citizen to track the stock of mass supply in, in pharmacy. And there's another platform which allow individuals to voluntarily share their reports about their symptoms. And this app will download the user's location history to determine if they may have been exposed to the virus. So because of the um, fast measures from the government and the collaboration with the society, Taiwan successfully contains the spread of virus and keep the economy running. Now, Taiwan, our GDP, even uh, I know the world is suffering with the economic downturn, but in Taiwan, uh, every, we carry on as normal life mm -hmm. and um, we still maintain our GDP growth above one. Um, well, more, but in, more importantly, mm -hmm. the success, the successful, um, our success um, has created multiple factors to reinforce the consolidation of uh, Taiwanese identity, therefore has a great implication to cross trade conflict. So I'm going to point out those factors that and use social constructivism to explain how the social context allow the factor to be effective. So the first factor is a success based uh, our success, uh, Taiwan's success in responding COVID-19 is based on the based on democracy. Uh, because the formation of a Taiwanese identity has gone through three stages. And the on uh, the third stage also, which is the current stage of Taiwanese identity, is hugely associated with the value of democracy. So in my, ch in my chapter, I use social constructivists to see how economic development and multiple social movements have created these ties between democracy and Taiwan's identity. Sorry, but I don't have enough time to elaborate on that today. So in the response of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, Taiwan contains the spread of virus through democratic measures and transparency. So the political and public health system not only just differentiate the value of China and Taiwan, but also consolidate Taiwanese identity, which build upon the value of democracy. And the second um, factor that um, helped 
consolidate Taiwanese identity's international percep perception. Um, because of the outstanding performance of Taiwan, news media around the globe began to recognize and reference Taiwan's model. So I'm now in, living in Taiwan every day when I uh, use my Facebook, I can see post, uh, posters or uh, video expressing their gratitude of being Taiwanese or being able to live in Taiwan. You can see that on social media everywhere. So it shows the rising sense of pride of Taiwanese identity. And in fact, before the pandemic, the difference in international perception toward Taiwan and China has been a major factor shaping Taiwanese identity. According to Pew Research, uh, in a recent year, Western countries show a growing unfavorable view on China. Um, the re uh, reason behind it include China's inhumane, uh, inhumane measures toward Muslim minority and Hong Kongers, and as well as because of the uh, trade war, espionage, and stealing classified information, etc. So all of this uh, motivate Taiwanese people to differentiate themselves from China. And according to a social identity theory, it's also a, a social constructivist um, theory, it predicts that the categorization of process will lead to prejudicial and discriminatory attitude toward outgroup. So all of this um, all of this factor has also leads to an escalation of superiority of Taiwan's identity. And the last factor is the unification approach from China. So in a time of, uh, in a time of COVID pandemic, Chinese pressure has keep Taiwan out from attending WHO and WHA. And China insists that um, Taiwan can participate only under one China policy, which means that ta uh, Taiwan need to admitted that we are part of China. And actually that raised outrage in Taiwan and uh, Beijing objection on Taiwan's participation in, global, um, in the global community as an act of depriving self-esteem of Taiwan. Um, so according to Bert, uh, John Burton, he's a, a conflict resolution expert, he suggests that deprivation of the individual and group needs can lead to intractable conflict. It will also motivate them to use other means to satisfy, satisfy their needs. So in April, we can see that Taiwanese people began a crowdfunding campaign to buy a full page advertisement on New York Times. And the ads aim to raise global awareness on Taiwan's willingness and ability to provide medical expertise to the world. And only within 15 minutes, the crowdfunding campaign garnered nearly 1 million US dollar. So, from this pandemic, you can see that Taiwanese um, has Taiwanese identity has again consolidated due to our outstanding performance on in responding COVID nineteen. And if Beijing wanted to provide uh, deprive this identity, um, Taiwanese people will strive even harder to gain global recognition. And in my set, so this is basically my my first part of my um, research. And my second part, I turn my focus back to the response to the COVID-19 and I asked the question of, can the uh, Taiwan model, Taiwan uh, Taiwan's successful model, can that be ap applicable in other countries or regions? And um, my analysis is no. Um, the reason is because I, uh, as I have mentioned that um, the measures that Taiwanese government used to contain a virus, including like merging data um, database uh, from health, national health insurance database and the immigration database and or like uh, disclosing people's uh, confirmed cases, their, um, their travel history. So actually these measures has great concern on, on the data provide privacy. And, but, the res but these measures that has a concern doesn't create backlash in Taiwan and in Taiwan society. The reason is because um, Taiwan is a, Taiwan, even though we are considered as the beacon of democracy in Asia, according to uh, Vice President Mike, uh, uh, according to Vice President Pence and Secretary Pompei Ao, but um, Taiwan's democracy is built on a uh, collectivism culture, which they, value group um, group benef um, benefit. So, um, so 
when the government trying to um, collect people um, people's data, um, there's, they didn't create any kinds of uh, backlash from the people. So this is the reason why I argued that it's an it's not Taiwan's model is not applicable in other what even in Western country, um, Western democratic country, and um. I'm looking at my clock right now and I know I'm running out of time. So, but thank you for listening to my, this is it's just a bit of my research and thank you very much. Thank you, Jasmine, indeed, first for joining us from Taipei at such an early hour in the morning. We greatly appreciate this. We welcome uh, that you have shared your insights with us and we look forward uh, most certainly to uh, the chapter you are uh, writing for us. I see questions and, and uh, approvals. Uh, we're going to have a short Q&A session uh, very soon. Uh, James, I'd just like to uh, signal to you, a number of our colleagues are trying to come into the Zoom room. So they're receiving some types of messages about uh, something already being in progress, another meeting in progress. Perhaps you could correspond. I believe they've CC'd you on the emails and we could let them in. It's Andrea Adams. Uh, it's John uh, Riley. There are a, a few colleagues, and I'll, I'll leave that to you. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, James. It's now my distinct pleasure to turn to another graduate of New York University from the uh, Master of Science in Global Affairs program. NYU is extremely engaged in the area of international relations and global affairs. Uh, Viola Roja is also a uh, research analyst at the Global Disinformation Index, and she's going to be speaking to us today about personal data collection in the context of a comparative study she's engaged in uh, with China and the United States. Thank you so much, Viola, for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Please go ahead, dear. Cool. cool. So hello, everyone, and again, thank you for having me. Uh, my contribution today will explore how these two countries uh, China and the US use personal data to perpetuate a system of oppression uh, that targets specific mi minorities uh, through several forms of, of incarceration. And how, and I'm going to explore also how the COVID pandemic exas exacerbated some ex aspects of these systems. So let's start with China. Um, as many of you might already know, China has done a lot to control the Uyghur Muslim minority in the, in the region of Xinjiang, uh, mainly because of economic reasons and internal stability. So these efforts specifically uh, escalated in 2016 uh, with the so-called uh, strike hard campaign against terrorists, as um, a lot of the Uyghurs attempts to gain independence um, took, the, took the form of terrorist attacks. So um, during this campaign, uh, we saw a heavy uh, securitization of the region with police stations and personnel on every corner and surveillance systems and checkpoints and also like um, tracking apps on people's phones to basically track every move of the population, population in this region and especially the Uyghur uh, population. Um, the Uyghur's minority, um, as a consequence, regularly endured uh, arbitrary detention. So Uyghurs that act suspiciously according to the government standards are arrested, tried, convicted, and they are basically sent to these political education camps, so called, they are so-called political ed education camps, which officially basically are aimed at de-radicalized potential terrorists. However, uh, we've seen from interviews and footage and other, and other um, investigative um, work that in, in these uh, detention center, prisoners are often mistreated, tortured, and the conditions there are very unsanitary and the cells are often overcrowded and so on. So um, now with a COVID-19 pandemic, there have been a couple of, de of developments. On one hand, we have like the conditions in the detention fa facilities became even worse. Um, unfortunately, data on the, on the entity of this development are hard to find because the government, the Chinese government has no incentive to share truthful information whatsoever. And it is also hard to gather witnesses, stories and um, testimonies as uh, pr prisoners cannot 
receive visitors anymore and the rules about calling from prison that become, became even stricter. In addition to this, uh, it seems that um, a program tied up to these, uh, to these detention centers had have been revitalized. This program was created in um, 2018 and it was officially um, meant to reduce poverty in the Uyghur community. But what actually happened was that Uyghurs detained in these camps were forced to work for free um, or, or for basically nothing um, in factories throughout the region. Factories that are often um, owned by Western companies. Now, since the pandemic, um, since the, the pandemic started, um, this, pover this poverty reduction program seems to be revitalized, and uh, we have seen a lot of prisoners seems to have been uh, sent to work for PPE factories as the supply chain expanded like significantly uh, in responses to the increase in demand. So um, if in China we have um, a very targeted program to specifically control a minority population, in the US the systemic oppression of black and brown minorities is more subtle and it is the result of a set of policies that started uh, back in the 60s and the 70s. So um, the pol politicians back then basically exploited um, white electorate spheres of the 60s uh, civil rights movement and offered as the only solution the, uh, a heavy investment in law enforcement in order to regain control. If that sounds familiar <laughs> right now. Um, so this, nar this narrative took, uh, took a turn with the crack cocaine epidemic that hit many uh, poor neighborhoods, which were, which were opportunely also populated mainly by, by black people. And so now politicians had a, motiva a motivation to heavily um, police and target black communities without explicitly saying that. Um, so three uh, administrations basically, starting with Reagan and, 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 and continuing with Bush and, and Clinton, uh, developed these kind of policies under the name of war on drugs. Um, and the whole thing was also heavily sensationalized in the media. As a consequence, the law enforcement budget exploded and the jail populations exploded, which, which was then, this phenomenon was then called mass incarceration, as the U.S. still has the highest rate of incarceration in the world and uh, most of the people in prisons, uh, in prison, uh, or jail are black and brown. So the problem with mass incarceration um, is that basically it creates a system of oppression of, of black and brown people as people who, has, who, has, who have been incarcerated, once they're released, are basically denied access of main, you know, to uh, main, the mainstream society and economy as, for example, they don't have the right to vote, they are excluded from, from juries, they are legally denied the ability to, to obtain unemployment, to, to obtain employment, housing, public benefits, and also, for example, to access scholarships and loans because of their uh, previous conviction. Um, however, this situation is evolving and basically mass incarceration is um, somehow uh, transitioning uh, to a heavy use of probation and parole. Um, as people, with people under supervision, uh, under supervision of the state or the, of the federal government. So basically these, these people are required to follow numerous rules that often don't make sense and of course, in, for, and they don't actually help uh, people to, you know, get back, reintegrate into society. So people are often incarcerated for violating these rules of their supervision. And again, they receive disproportionate punishment and this of course feeds again prisons and jails. Um, when it comes to parole and probation, uh, the use of you know, personal data is reinforcing the system of oppression. Um, the way this happens is basically a, a heavy use of electronic offender tracking devices like ankle bracelet, bracelets. Um, now, we have seen a steady increase of the use in, of these tracking devices starting from 2014. Uh, so prisons are not, it seems like prisons are not like physical st structures anymore, but 
the prisoner's own home then becomes the prison as uh, thanks to these tracking systems. Now with the COVID pandemic, um, there are several things happening uh, in relation to, um, to parole and probation. And um, mainly, so prisons, um, first of all, well, prisons and jails are often hotspots hotspot for COVID to spread, not only within the facilities, but also in the community uh, outside the facility themselves, because we have like prison, prison personnel that goes in and out every day. And so start, states started to, um, to admit less and less people to jails, so state and jails, um, especially with the ones with minor crimes. Um, um, and this might be, uh, might be um, read as a, as a positive effect in weakening that oppressive system because more people could get dismissed for minor crimes. So they don't feed prisons anymore and, and or like the system of supervision. Um, on the other hand, we have um, actual prisons that are considering uh, releasing older prisoners, those, those whose conviction is near its end and those uh, convicted with, with minor, with milder crimes. So um, this would happen, and this would happen with probation and su or supervision systems, which often uh, involves tracking devices. So this is a major development because it has the potential to uh, basically in in increase the use of tracking devices to perpetuate against the system of oppression, not anymore in the physical uh, jail or, or prison, but in the, in the prisoners' home, homes. So, that was uh, that was my contribution. I tried to save some time, <laughs> and thank you so much for listening. That is most appreciated, Viola. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, we have an opportunity now to have a, a brief question and answer session. You may also post questions uh, in the chat, or you can simply uh, raise your hand and ask the question. Is there someone who would like to begin or uh, pose a question? James, I don't know if we can also take questions from the live stream. However, uh, we have designated a little time for Q&A. So is there someone who would like to either ask a question or make a comment? Please, Constantin. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, um, to the professor who did the presentation on uh, COVID in the European Union. I forgot your name and Zoom only shows CR. Would you mind letting me know what your name is? Sorry. Um, yes, I just wanted to basically Christian, ask. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Christian. Christian. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I basically just wanted to ask you, uh, because you were being very optimistic about um, the potential for the EU to, in the future, to tackle a crisis like this. Um, and I just wanted to ask you just, I mean, the last 10 years of the European Union with um, the financial crisis, the Greek financial crisis and the 2015 uh, um, immig immigration crisis. Um, and now this very messy uh, and chaotic uh, response of the EU to the virus. Um, why exactly you think that the EU um, in a similar crisis like this, maybe in like five or 10 years has the potential to overcome the national um, differences and uh, points of um, tension. Okay. May I? Yeah. Okay. Please do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, Constantine for this question because uh, it gives me the opportunity to uh, deepen in, in, the, in the discourse. Uh, I'm optimistic with with the future of the European Union because the, the EU uh, put in place a lot of uh, measures during this pandemic. The problem is that uh, a part of the political uh, uncoordination that there is in the European Union there is a we're facing a problem of disinformation or not non-information on on what the european union is doing uh, at the european union level and at the state state level because um i mean 
I'm studying the European Union and I, I had difficulty in finding all the information a couple of uh, weeks ago because we were writing a, a piece. And so uh, I, I don't wonder uh, why people is not confident towards the European Union, because there are uh, no information on what they are doing. Even if uh, Mrs. von der Leyen is going on TV uh, sometimes uh, saying we are doing this and this, but there is no information whatsoever. You have to, to, to look into the European Union website and find the, the information. And the states are not uh, taking sometimes the opportunity that the European Union is, is giving. And uh, also the, the citizens. Uh, that's one point. The other point is that uh, the, 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 mm, the statesmen, when, when they go to the European Union and they gather together, they know what the EU is doing for, for their states. So that's why I'm, I'm confident that in the future, uh, the solution would be to sit down for, uh, for President Conte, for, um, I mean, uh, Angela Merkel, if she's still there, and all the other, uh, uh, I mean, uh, European leaders, uh, courts, and, and so on, to sit down and to find a solution for stay together in the, uh, future 50 years or perhaps more because uh, the EU is giving stability to the European states and the, another problem would be in the eastern part of, of Europe that would be a problem because they are uh, still naive to the uh, European Union concept I, 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 I guess I suspect and that, that's my my, my view. I, I hope I to, 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 have, uh, to have given a reply to your question. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Constantin. Are there other questions at this time for any of our initial three speakers? Please, Veronica, go ahead, dear. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my question is for David Unger, although it's for anyone who knows anything about Italy specifically. Um, you mentioned a general lack of public trust in the government, whether it is the central government or regional governments. Um, and being Italian, I understand what you mean. Um, do you think we will ever get to the point where Italians actually trust their institutions or is that sort of wishful thinking? And maybe, I mean, if maybe, Evaluating the COVID uh, response can help in, you know, gaining trust in the government. Yes, uh, great question. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit optimistic of that. I think that after all, the, the last elections returned two parties that were against government, right? That talked about the political caste and the referendum just this Sunday cut the size of parliament, which is part of that same momentum, the same, the same purpose. Now we have a bit of a hybrid in that the PD is a party of the traditional political class and the Cinque Stella is disintegrating. So we don't know what we have. But look at those regional elections on Sunday. And two regions in particular, uh, in, in the Veneto, Zaya of the Lega, won an overwhelming vote of confidence because of his very good handling of the COVID crisis. And in Campania, De Luca of the PD also emerged with a vote of confidence, which I think reinforces the point I wanna make, which is that success or failure is very largely at the local level, all right? That you can have all, I mean, you see the chaos in the United States where you have different messages at different levels of government and people, people who honestly want to follow good advice, not knowing the CDC says aerosols, the CDC says not aerosols, whatever. I think that you get coherence at the local level and you get buy-in at the local level or you don't, all right? Coming back a little bit to Constantine's question, I think you couldn't be further from the local level than Brussels, right? But I think that the role ideally Brussels could play 
is providing resources and administrative coordination for action which has to come up from the local level. Some not a one size fits all policy perhaps on immigration, not a one size fit all policy on closing borders, but a set of protocols that local entities can work out their parameters within. Finally, to the, to the center of your question, I think at the national level, uh, it's, it's a bit of a miracle that, that Conte, uh, Christian calls him president because he's president of the Council of Ministers, Americans call him prime minister. Anyway, Conte has consistently gotten a vote of confidence of 60% for his handling of the pandemic, even though we're into a, a bit of a second wave now, all right? And I think that's people are saying, compared to, compared to Berlusconi, compared to some of the people we had before, it looks like someone who's at least trying to do a good job and maybe ask the right people sometimes. So I think that this, this crisis has, has built a de facto higher level of trust among Italians in government than existed before. Fragile, could be blown away easily. I think politics as usual has begun as people now position themselves for the next national election and take stock of the regional elections, but that could be good, you know? And what's certainly good is that the people who followed the most admirable and successful policies are incentivized to do more by the vote of confidence they got. So I'm optimistic. Wonderful, thank you so much. Well, once again, I wanna thank our initial speakers. We're going to transition now uh, from Taiwan back to the United States. And it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Andrea Adams, Esquire, of the University of the District of Columbia, who will address ethical considerations for app-mediated research of different classifications of data. Andrea, we're so glad that you're joining us today. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, and I can, uh, I can, you can tell probably that I'm pretty nervous and I prepared some remarks, so forgive me as I'm kind of reading through them. Um, I'll be looking back and forth. So um, I'm Andrea Adams, as uh, Colette said, a professor at uh, the University of the District of Columbia. I'm also an attorney and a psychologist. And my contribution to the volume was to explore ways to help mobile app designers understand the ethical standards applied to gathering app-mediated anonymous data, especially um, from vulnerable research participants. Specifically, I was asked to provide an ethical review of the Safe City uh, website and app for its deployment in the United States. The Safe City app captures stories from sexual assault victims who have been assaulted, who have been assaulted in public spaces and crowd maps the assault's location. You'll hear more about Safe City from the next presentation of my colleagues Elsa and Suzanne. My review encompassed informed consent and other ethical considerations for this type of research. Um, the, Safe City, the Safe City app didn't start out as being um, a tool for research, but after um, capturing a lot of the data, the designers decided that it would provide valuable information for researchers. They also wanted to ensure that since most of the people that were providing the information were um, uh, sexual assault victims, that they um, would get the uh, appropriate uh, ethical protections. So when I first started reviewing this, um, I looked at the regulatory scheme and found that um, for app developers, uh, you need a global perspective. And app space is really global space. It's country driven. And it was clear that there would be different um, regulatory schemes that needed to be understood. Further, um, when concentrating on the United States, it was clear that um, app mediated research was being driven by uh, the medical profession um, because they had developed and had reviewed with F uh, by ethical standards, what needed to be captured for um, apps that captured medical information. And though that medical information is really personal and identified data. 
another aspect of regulation was consumer regular, regulators who regulated app designers and platforms. And um, their focus was really um, specific to consumer apps, not apps like uh, the Safe City app that I was reviewing. It, because Safe City uh, attempts to capture anonymous information anonymously from sexual assault victims, it was clear that with respect to non-personal, um, non-identified data, um, there wouldn't be a lot of regulation. And that was true um, in the EU. Uh, the EU specifically said that um, in their um, data protection regulations that uh, data that was not not that was not personal nor identified would be subject to their comprehensive review, and in in 2016 they actually redid and provided a re, uh, data standards for all of the nations that are signatories to the EU. But what changed and became a focus of this study was that. Um, there needed to be additional classifications of data to really understand whether or not this um, data that was captured that is non-personal uh, and non-identified uh, would be subject to future regulations. Uh, the, the idea that you can classify data as personal identified versus non-personal and, and non-identified um, meant that there wasn't sufficient classification there to really understand what um, new data types look like, look like. There's also large amounts of metadata, and metadata is defined as data about data. <laughs> and um, there was concern that even metadata, which everybody um, utilizes all the time, it's non-personal, it's non-identified, that metadata might start being considered something that regulators might look at. One example of this is IP addresses. Um, IP addresses have long been considered um, metadata and therefore non-regulated. But um, some jurisdictions, especially in the EU, EU, have been looking at that data and saying, hey, you know what, um, this data may have some identifiable characteristics that we need to regulate. So what I did in the study was I provided a, a two by two matrix of personal versus identified data. The upper left corner, personal identified data, and the lower right box is non-personal, non-identified data. What was new to the classification was adding a category of um, personal but non-identified data, and then adding a category of non-personal but identified data. An example of personal but not identified data is pseudomized data. And, um, the literature talks about pseudomized data as still needing um, protection from um, uh, informed consent, et cetera, um, and also requiring some protection around making sure that uh, the pseudonym is kept private. And the study revealed that there are many processes that app designers are actually designing that um, fit that, fit that mode. But the next um, set of data, non-personal but identified data, which would be in that lower left box, um, is, is of great concern because it's sensitive data. Because even though it's non-personal, it does have identifiable characteristics associated with it. And one example of that is location data. Um, location data, uh, if you, if you look at your smartphone and you're on an app, a lot of times the, the app will say, can I share the device's location? And what it's doing that is because consumer um, regulators have said, you know, this data is sensitive. And so we're gonna regulate that by requiring that um, people that are using the de device actually give permission for that. So that's an example of this kind of non-personal but identified data. And since I was reviewing um, Safe Cities app, um, one of the things that Safe City captures is location data from self-report stories. And both of those kinds of data are sensitive in that um, there, there's a chance that that data might be re-identified um, in other processes.
Also, there is some concern now about even non-personal, non-identified data. Um, authors Reed and Bachel talked about data aggregators that are out there taking this non-personal, non-identified data. They're not concerned about the personal aspects of it, but they're really focused on using that data and aggregating that data with other data. And in so doing, um, the authors show results where they've actually been able to track individuals by capturing and aggregating non-personal, non-identified data. Another important um, uh, article talked about how um, capturing certain data might be um, combined, uh, especially uh, data of uh, community incidents, incidents that happen in a community, combining that data with other data might also make the data that is not normally considered to be um, non-personal but identified able to be tracked back to individuals. One of the specific things they talked about was um, the fact that when you capture and you combine that data for communities, that the communities themselves might have a stigma attached to them because of that data. Even though it's not non-personal, the identification of the community might make that data, might make the community um, unable to change the reputation of that community based upon the com combination of those data. So, um, the question becomes for app designers is, do apps have sufficient ethical protections to warn individuals of the risks that exist beyond the disclosure of their personal information? And the last section of the article that um, I provided suggestions for the app, as well as a track for mobile there's reform consent, data privacy, and security, storage, and data sharing, and all of the references that have that note where those suggestions are found. And so lastly, I'll say um, my other suggestions and things that I've gathered from this review is that availability of data should not drive research strategies. The next thing is that participants um, should get enough information to balance the risk, and they should also have some control over their data where possible, where it's not aggregated or anonymized. Also, um, questions should be asked about data being collected where unintended, unintended consequences result. And, um, you know, that was something that was really um, talked about with respect to Safe City because they were des desiring to provide the data in an open source environment, which means that they really did need to vet people that were coming to get the data to make sure they weren't going to combine it in such a way that would reveal the identity of the participants. And lastly, I'll say um, it's important to review regulatory changes. Um, part of the study um, showed that uh, video is beginning to overtake text as um, the amount of volume that is going across through app apps and smartphones. And so if video overtakes text, then the question becomes, can you keep that information private and how can you keep it private? And so that's a consideration that people need to look for in the future. So thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea, for that presentation. Uh, and we look forward to a further Q&A after our next set of presentations. And I would like to turn now uh, our attention to Professor Suzanne goodney Leah of uh, the Red Dot Foundation, Safe City, and also of the uh, University of the District of Columbia. And she is going to be speaking uh, with our colleague, Elsa Marie De Silva, also of the Red Dot Foundation and the BMW Foundation, Herbert Quant Responsible Leaders Community. Uh, I will leave it to you to decide who will be speaking first. Uh, Elsa will also be um, mentioning the Gender Alliance, uh, a very significant initiative, which also had a very important uh, event today. So I turn it over to you ladies. Thank you. Thank you, Colette, for having us. And uh, thank you, Andrea, for a lovely presentation. Um, and good evening to all of you from Mumbai. I think I met some of you last week when I did the session with Napinai. 
But now we have the opportunity to learn more about my work at uh, Red Dot Foundation. So about seven years ago, we had this horrific gang rape of a young woman, Jyoti Singh, on a bus in Delhi. I don't know if you heard about it, but it certainly made a lot of news in my country. And at the time, I was working in the aviation industry. I was vice president network planning for one of India's largest airlines. And I had a portfolio of 500 daily flights. And, um, you know, but despite that, I was looking for my purpose. And I had had enough of... Uh, working in the sector because I was reaching the 20 year mark. I wanted to do something different. And when this incident occurred, it really got me thinking more deeply about my own experiences of sexual violence, but more also about the larger uh, topic. Since everyone around me started to open up and share about their own incidents. And what I realized was that though it was so common, until then we never really spoke about it even to each other and um, there was a gap a data gap that's why i mentioned my aviation sector because in order to do the work i was doing i was relying heavily on data historical data to identify trends and patterns to make current and future decisions and that's literally the concept i applied with safe city which i launched with some friends 10 days after the gang rape. And the reason why I did it was I didn't feel it was enough to went on social media or put up black posters or participate in candlelight vigils, all of which are important. But I felt for me, I needed to do something more concrete. And um, therefore, launching this crowd map, crowd map means a crowdsourced platform where people can anonymously share their stories. They are visualized on a map as hotspots. And uh, it's, as Andrea said, open sourced for people to access it and do with it as they would please. Now, when I say that, I'm talking about a world that we are currently living in where we are constantly actually using such data. How many of you use TripAdvisor? I do. How many of you use Yelp or some sort of uh, software that tells you uh, ratings for restaurants and Goodreads? And there's so many things, whether it's the books you read, the movies you watch, or even the Uber driver's rating. We are constantly, you know, using information that is crowdsourced to rate stuff, right? So I looked at this as if we were to anonymously share our story. One is you document what has happened to you because otherwise it has never happened. There's no proof of it except in your mind and nobody knows about it. Official statistics are highly underreported. Second is it makes something that is invisible visible because now you can see it. You can see it visually on a map. And third is with this information that is now available to you. I live in India. In my country, open sourced data, government data, crime data is not easily accept, uh, is not easily available. And even if it were available, it would not be uh, at the granular level that it is at uh, on the safe city map, which is the street level. So we launched this platform and immediately the story started pouring in, but of course it started to taper. And that's when I realized, you know, I have to do something further. So we started to engage with community-based nonprofits uh, who had trust in the community. So somebody spoke earlier about COVID-19 and how their countries have, you know, uh, adapted to the pandemic, but also, um, you know, implemented protocols. Now these protocols can only be implemented effectively if there's trust built in the community. And I felt that the NGOs had that trust which helped women and girls to break their silence and part with their stories, which really is the hardest thing I've ever done in the last seven years. And with this information, you don't need big data, but you need gender disaggregated data that is relevant. You can start to understand the trends and patterns emerging in that location, in that neighborhood. And then again, because it's open source, the community can look at it, evaluate it and decide for themselves what is it that they want to do with it. And we've had 
amazing responses from art on walls to address staring to um, community meetings with the police where the community would never have otherwise engaged with the police because police is someone you fear, there's no trust. But here they speak with authority because they have the data to, to share and so on and so forth. On the other end, we also work directly with the police where we share the dashboards with them and this helps them in their own decision making and allows them to change their beat patrol or vigilance patterns. But what I've found in the last seven years is that if you had this information or you made it easy for people to come forward and give you these stories, it is a wealth of knowledge which not only helps us understand the issue better, because violence is a spectrum of violence. It's not a particular type of violence. There are many forms of it, verbal, nonverbal, physical, extreme physical, et cetera. And the solutions are not the same for everything in every place. So the solution for rape is very different for staring is very different from commenting. And all of this is important to address because ultimately it contributes to an insecure culture which where the woman has to prove her innocence all the time whilst there are bystanders who turn the other way and don't do anything. And a system that is Again, not trustworthy. The justice system takes forever to, um, you know, uh, get any result going. So, in a way, I feel if we have to address sexual and gender-based violence, we have to do it in a preventive manner. And again, I come back from that example I gave earlier. You use historical experiences, which are true experiences of what women and girls face or their lived experiences to identify patterns and trends that can help you implement better solutions in at the neighborhood level. So we start small and then move upwards. And today we are refurbishing our app with all of Andrea's inputs. We are making every effort to not even collect IP addresses. So if you don't need personal help, you won't have to sign up. You won't have to give any of that data. And we are also in the process of hopefully partnering with cities to have such dashboards where they can then look at it and define what are safe and inclusive cities. So I'm going to stop here. Suzanne's going to take over and I'll come back to talk about the gender alliance. Hi, everyone. It's so exciting to be here. This is the favorite conference I go to every year. Um, it's the, by far the most interesting um, and dynamic, and I'm so excited to be here. And um, the theme of inclusivity embodies, um, in a nutshell, um, you know, what Elsa built. I'm, you know, now helping to take that global, um, along with uh, my brilliant colleague, uh, Andrea, and uh, our entire team. Um, and, you know, the thing that stands out with this approach um, is it starts with the people to drive policy for the people. I remember when I met Elsa, we went to, um, we were uh, on a peace fellowship with the Rotary Foundation in Thailand, and we took a trip out to the Myanmar border. And while we were there, we were, oh no, it was in Nepal. We were touring around Nepal, and we you know, were in a village visiting, looking at different households. And in the corner of this one, um, you know, this family had in, you know, invited us in, and you know, we were meeting and talking with people. And I saw this giant container from UK Aid, um, which was proudly marked on it. And, um, and I said, well, what is that? And they said, oh, that's to store grain and seeds. And I said, well, is there anything in it? No. And you know, this two people could have slept in this space and there's nothing in it. So clearly nobody went and asked them what they needed before they came in to bring them a solution. Um, we flip that and we do that the opposite direction. We talk, you know, we collect stories and that's such personal intimate data. Um, that people are willing to share because this problem is so horrible. This is, you know, the pandemic that we just don't talk about, right? Um, and it's been going on for far too long. And um, when people share those stories, um, you know, that's a great trust given to us. And they're sharing them because they want this to change. You know, they're sharing the most terrible thing that ever happened to them in many cases. Um, and so we, you know, believe that um, a big part of our role is you know collecting and curating that data and putting it on a map, which was absolutely brilliant. Um, Elsa came out of the airline industry, and so she thought in terms of maps. 
Um, but when you put data like that on a map, um, it becomes undeniable. I mean, you see the dots, you can't, you can't turn away. Um, and it demands action, um, you know, and, and thinking about that, you know, I'm in uh, the United States, um, right in the District of Columbia, uh, the nation's capital, and we're watching this horror of, you know, that's been going on for 400 years, finally, you know, reaching into the ethers of um, the culture and saying, you know, in terms of the police use of deadly force, saying, this cannot continue. But the biggest problem with addressing that issue, just as with gender-based violence, is there's no data. There is no data in this country kept consistently on the use of police, use of deadly, even deadly force, deadly force by the state. No consistent data. It's, you know, appalling. And it's the same with gender-based violence around the planet, in this country, everywhere. And, um, and so, you know, when you collect these stories, um, you know, they're so deeply private, you, you, we take them back to the people. And we, you know, we look as they go on the map, we can see the clusters of incidents. Um, and then we go back to the community and we say, hey, you know, we have this cluster of incident, what should we do about it, right? The community always knows, um, you know, what's wrong. It's just that nobody ever really asked them, right? And so this data demands a return to the community and an empowerment of the community, right? It's just like akin to broken windows theory, the community, um, essentially becomes um, engaged and they own the, the solution. Um, you know, we've seen really interesting things like uh, there was one corner um, where there was a lot of um, men that would be taking tea um, and they would be uh, ogling and making comments on female passerbys. And, you know, so there was a lot of data points that came up for this location. We went back to the community. What's going on? Um, you know, and they explained and, you know, we said, well, what could we do about it? Brilliant, innovative, super creative solutions. One of the best one was artists, artistry. Let's paint a mural on the side of the wall of, of a giant pair, pair of leering eyes. And after that, as the men were sipping their tea, they were like, mm, you know, those eyes are kind of creepy. Really? Yeah, they are, aren't they? And things begin to change, right? It's not that, you know, there, there's, when we say gender-based violence, um, it tends to be directional at this point, um, but it's not, you know, men are not the enemy, they're part of the solution. Men and boys must be part of the solution. The only way to fix this is to collect, you know, uh, everyone together to begin to address the problem. Um, and, you know, when you engage the community, the community, wants peace and, and inclusivity and, you know, um, a, a collective solution. They don't want conflict. Nobody wants conflict. Um, and so, you know, that becomes the pathway uh, forward. And, um, you know, and the goal really for us of the data is to impact the lived experience of people, right? And so um, COVID um, has been very interesting for us because it's, you know, we work in public spaces um, the public spaces are a little up in the air, but this pause allows us to equip and think about and rethink and prepare for a different kind of public space engagement that makes it safer for everyone to be involved. Because if everyone can't be in the public space safety, safely, we don't have a democracy. You cannot tell me we have a democracy if you can't have everyone having access to the public sphere. Um, you know, and it's also caused us to have to pivot in terms of um, what we look at, you know, domestic violence. Um, online harassment. These are suddenly public problems, um, you know, that have to be looked at and addressed in a different way. And so, um, you know, the, but the data is where it starts. And you don't change it without the data um, from the people driving action by the people. We're simply the conduits. And uh, Elsa is going to talk a little bit about the Gender Alliance as well. So thank you, Suzanne. And um, you all heard about the online harassment last week. Um, so that's the work that we have, we are doing with Napinai, who is um, the cyber law expert in India. Um, and we are training thousands of young people on understanding what is consent culture, but also their rights and how to responsibly use tech. Having said that, I do believe that none of this can be solved in isolation or if we work in silos. And therefore, it's extremely important to bring a diverse set of people to the table to work together on the solution. 
thing is that we always put ourselves in boxes or we put ourselves in silos. And so for me, there's no, it's non-negotiable. You have to put gender on the agenda in as many ways as possible. Now we are part of Colette and I, are, we are part of this BMW Foundation Network, but we are also part of several other German networks by default. And so I thought, why not, you know, organize people across all these networks around the theme of gender. So that's what Colette was talking about, where last month we organized the Gender Alliance Summit, which for the first time brought together 200 people from over 50 countries, and yet 40% of them don't work on gender. But they are interested on this topic, and they think that they can make a difference. And from there emerged nine projects that were co-created on those three days. And today we pitched to the larger community. Not all the projects required funding in terms of money. They may have required expertise or some uh, volunteer time or um, any other resources. So in our network, we have say Canada, which is highly feminist as a country. They have toolkits that are highly advanced, but there are other countries that may not have been so advanced in the way they uh, think of gender. So you can kind of match people and you don't have to recreate the wheel, but you can use what is already out there. And that's our philosophy with Safe City as well. We are, now that we are refurbishing the app, it's a platform. It will be easy to collaborate. You can make customized forms and you don't have to recreate the tech. We will manage the tech for you, but you can just you know, get in touch with us if you want to launch it in your place. So yeah, so that's a little bit about the power of collaboration. And I do believe that if we all collectively did our bit, the world would be definitely a safer and inclusive place. Thank you, Paulette, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Elsa, and thank you, Suzanne, uh, for that presentation. We have a, a little time for a question and answer. Uh, for any of our speakers in the second uh, group. Uh, once again, you can feel free to, to raise your hand or post a question in the chat. Uh, is there anyone who would like to begin, please? Uh, Ivory, go ahead, dear. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and for all the speakers for the insightful presentation. My name is Ivory, I'm from Indonesia. I have a question for Professor Adams and Leah. Um, I want to know how we disperse, diversifying and prioritize stakeholders' interests in regulating data collection and data protection policy for every kind of purpose. Because policy recommendations are often so reactive for the need to provide immediate responses, I think no one can really make an exact forecast on how a policy could impact the whole system in the long run. And most of the time, you do not have the privilege to delve deeper into the issue that we should tackle and the various variables that we could use. So how we minimize the damage, ensuring the policy will not exacerbate the current situation. Thank you. So, uh, so Suzanne, I think that's more for you. My, um, from, a, from a technical perspective, um, you know, we're, we're focused on making sure that as people are providing information that their that their information is protected and they understand exactly how the information is being used and and then we have a commitment to make sure that information that is provided to us we are treating that information carefully i think um uh, elsa talked about and uh, and uh suzanne talked about community focus and the, the process of Safe City has been to engage communities and, and in terms of making sure that the communities and the, 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 the folks that are providing the information are engaged in making sure that their information is used appropriately. And so the, the combination of engaging communities and protecting the data um, from a technical standpoint, uh, from my perspective, ensures that um, people have ownership and they're able to um, direct how that information is used going forward. And, and that ownership is, is really the key piece of that, I think. Um, and you know, the real purpose of starting with the community, um, what you're describing, um, Ivory, is, 
is what I think of as unanticipated consequences. Um, and often policy, I for worked for the last 10 years um, in policy, trying to link experts with uh, everyday citizens to come up with more innovative policy ideas. And one thing I learned in doing that is the experts are terrible often at, at anticipating the potential unanticipated consequences. Everyday citizens are much better at that, right? And so when, when you base yourself within community, you start with community, you go back to community, the community has a deep wisdom about how things work within their world. And that's the other part of this. It, it varies substantially um, by culture and location. And so you have to be anchored in, in, a, in, a, in a setting. And that community knows exactly, you know, it knows itself, right? As well as you or I would know ourselves. And so they, you know, in thinking through intuitively, you know, think through, work in those, those consequences, in, you know, just by the process of knowing themselves. And so when you start there, you're much more likely to end up with, um, you know, solutions that, are going to work in the longer run and not have so many like side effects to where you have, you know, this giant bin sitting empty, taking up, you know, one eighth of the housing space. Um, you know, that's, that's to me how, you know, I think that you avoid that. And uh, so I hope that's helpful to addressing your question. So in addition to what Suzanne said, policy change takes a long time. And this time during COVID-19, for example, we realized that there is a gap in the way legislation is implemented for domestic violence in India. You know, women in abusive relationships were not being able to access services. So we filed a public interest litigation in the Supreme Court of India, and she represented us. And when it came for hearing, the Supreme Court said, go back and work with the government. And that's now gone into a loop, but we are trying different ways of getting public support through change.org, which is an online petition platform, as well as trying to look at, you know, peace mediation, finding somebody else who might be close to the minister. The problem in my country is that all decisions are made through the prime minister's office. So even the minister may not have power. So I think policy change, you have to keep chipping away, but at the same time, the real power is educating the community and that has more effect. Thank you so much. And we're right on time. So I'd like to transition now to our uh, last panel uh, speaker cohort, beginning with Ziad al Achkar, who is uh, joining us from the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School of Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. He and Charles Martin Shields have authored a innovative chapter addressing data in the context of human subjects, universities as sites of data collection. Ziad, welcome. It's a pleasure to see you again. Of course, you were very engaged in the first effort we made to uh, create the Journal of Genocide Studies and Prevention special issue. So it's wonderful to have that continuity between that publication and this one. Welcome. Thank you, Colette. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. And um, as Colette mentioned, I'll be surely presenting a paper that really started with Charles about a couple of years ago that he presented at our last workshop. And then I'm coming on board as a kind of a second author. Um, and we really wanted in this paper to kind of examine how does institutional review boards operating and within academia um, and educational institutions, um, the challenges that come um, out of digital research and especially digital research conducted through remote sensing uh, and other autonomous uh, data collection means and how do IRB review boards um, need to think about some of the additional risk or new risks that come out of um, using digital systems for human subject research. And so the paper um, is broken into multiple pieces. Um, we kind of, we go through what are the, the kind of the unique risks and unique um, threats that come out of this. And so doing a survey research, for example, um, is, is kind of a little bit different using digital systems, especially when you're relying on third party um, applications. Uh, that is because you're often collecting um, 
passive data, you could, you're often collecting passive data, uh, especially in vulnerable communities. And so oftentimes in IRB review boards, for those of you who, who are not in academia, um, you have to get the individuals that which you're collecting data, um, you have to get them to sign a informed consent form uh, that outlines the risks um, and outlines the research in being developed um, and what the data is being used for. The issue kind of comes with uh, using remote sensing or passive tools is that oftentimes um, you're conducting this data collection over a time period and you can't, um, you can't be 100% sure about when the data is being collected. You're doing this in communities. For example, you might be doing this in a city uh, or in a village. You might be using uh, drone footage or a satellite imagery, or you might be trying to collect, for example, phone records that uh, from everybody being used in town. Um, so that's one issue. So it becomes a little bit more complex. The second issue, uh, especially when it comes to using digital data, is the permanence of it. Um, data is often hard to get rid of. Once it's been collected, uh, especially once it's been collected using third party um, uh, companies or applications and it's posted up on a cloud, um, there's often different ways that after the data is even collected, you can restore it. Um, and if it's not the data itself, the metadata continues to be present in different forms and there's risks, of, uh, risks that come with that. And so what does it mean for, for protocols for research protocols and ethics in vulnerable communities, um, especially when it happens that some of these individuals uh, and oftentimes also these communities will be at risk for years after the research takes place. So many of you have spoken today about personal identifiable information. There's also another facet to this, which is demographically identifiable information, which goes beyond not just the individuals, but also the communities that are part of this, uh, the, the communities that are part of this research project. Um, and so what is the three kind of broad issues? Uh, first, again, is the automated nature that we find. Uh, the second is the permanence. And the third is the fact that their speed of technological change is outpacing regulatory oversight capacity. And that's often a problem just dealing with in education and academia is that bureaucracy takes a long time to adapt. Um, and so when we have these three issues together, we're putting ourselves in a position of potentially causing doing harm uh, while conducting digital research or re using remote sensing to conduct digital research. Um, and so from a method standpoint, um, when, you're, when you're typically conducting data collection um, and typically when you're conducting remote sensing tool, using remote sensing tools, you might want to know kind of, you know, what are the natural rhythms of individuals in their day uh, or how does communities uh, interact on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, you want to also collect this on a multiple days. You don't want to just do it on one day. The problems become the problem that you have in these issues is that what happens when an individual is not consent does not consent for the data be collected, um, but because they're part of this community, in that by mistake or unfortunately because it's being it's collecting all the data, um, and that individual's data is being collected. And so then the researcher has a question to ask themselves: What do you do with that data? Do you expunge the data from that day? Uh, or do you continue uh, running with the data and try to do it in a safe and ethical manner as much as possible? Um, the other issue you know, that we deal with in this chapter is what happens when you're dealing, and oftentimes it is the case, with third party or automated systems where you're not the only one who has access to this data. Uh, the data is, lies on a server somewhere uh, within another company that has its own term and use. Uh, when you're using a third-party app, you're no longer necessarily the only owner of the data. And so the ownership also is transferred and oftentimes to that party uh, or they have access to it and they have the ability to use it uh, in means and ways that you may not have intended to do. So uh, when you design your research protocols and when you got IRB approval. Oftentimes also, you know, we talk about collecting data in an anonymized way. Um, and try to maintain privacy, not collect data, or minimize the data collections. Uh, but unfortunately, we've also know that there's other ways, and there's multiple ways to actually re to, to basically run the anonymiza anonymization uh, potentially pointless through a, what's called the mosaic effect, which means that you can anonymize a data set by itself, but when you combine multiple data sets, oftentimes the data you've collected with other public available data sets 
it's often the case where um, a data set or individuals or, or a community that might have been um, anonymized in your data sets can then become actually known very well so. Uh, there's a tremendous case that uh, the New York Times have done late last summer, actually maybe a few months ago, uh, where they've tracked individual, individual phone uh, records and they were able to track people um, to their specific homes and specific location, although the data has been anonymized but that's because they were able to access other publicly available data sets. And so one of the big issues that comes with doing digital data um, research is the issue of power. Um, and we haven't really talked about this um, in these panels, but you know, technology is not neutral. Um, and it is those who control the technology or those who control the power. And when you're dealing with research, especially with vulnerable communities, you as a researcher have a tremendous amount of of power vis-a-vis -vis the, the vulnerable communities that you're working with. And unfortunately, many people do not take a participatory action, action research method, which would engage a lot more the communities um, and the processes and it would actually limit or give them ownership of uh, the research protocols and the research design. What happens oftentimes is that the technologies allow the researcher to get access to these data, uh, oftentimes very personal data, it gives them a leverage oftentimes over these communities, um, but also by, by the simple fact that technologies oftentimes are sold as being empowering, um, but they can also be very much the opposite of which. They can reinforce what um, you know, some call a data colonial approach or a technocolonial approach, where it's, it's, it's mostly extractive in nature. Um, it takes away the ownership of the individuals. Um, you know, I know James earlier was talking about this, uh, it takes away also the ability of individuals to, to to gain value out of their own out of their own personal data, their own stories, and so these are really risks that they're amplified when you're dealing with remote data collection. Um, and oftentimes, you're also dealing with technologies that you yourself, as a researcher, aren't 100% sure about how they operate um, because the algorithms are hidden behind a black box. And so you might just be able to see the front end applications of how they operate, but you're not sure how they operate on the back end and how the data is, is, is being siphoned or stored or who is actually being shared with or for how long. And so what we're, um, you know, we're, well, unfortunately we're not really offering many solutions in our chapter, or at least not this one. Um, but I think there's many ways that this work can be done uh, moving forward and done in such a way that um, IRB protocols within universities have to, have to be updated um, and have to reckon with the fact that we're dealing um, with a new age, we're dealing with a digital research age where technology and power, um, or, or technology give power to the researchers in ways that it didn't necessarily do so before, not to the scale it did when, you know, in the 1970s or 80s, uh, when a lot of these protocols were established. We have to bring back or have put a lot more emphasis on not just covering the legal aspects and the regulatory aspects that protect the universities, but also really understanding the risks and harms and how do you, engage in research that actually benefits the communities? And how do you engage the communities in the research protocols? Um, one of those ways is something that um, Sean, uh, Sean McDonald um, is a researcher and somebody who's been pushing this idea of data trusts, which has kind of developed a, a fiduciary um, responsibility between kind of citizens, governments, and data firms. And so this is kind of one way where IRB uh, protocols could look into how do you develop kind of these trust systems or data trust systems or some sort of new digital governance uh, approach that empowers the communities in which you're collecting this data um, continuously, um, but also make sure, making sure that the data is, is collected um, in a way that it's not gonna cause harm um, and developing an ethical transparent mechanism for then storing that data and using that data. Um, and so I think you know, for now, I, I will end this talk. I've gone a little bit over time and I'll, I'll happily answer questions uh, in the QA section. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ziad, first for the presentation and for uh, remaining within uh, time. That's much appreciated. I would like to turn now to our colleague, Professor John H. Riley at the United States Air Force Academy. And John is going to be addressing personal data collection ethics in the context of a specific program at the Academy. Welcome, John, we're delighted to see you. Thank you, Colette, it's delighted to see you as well. It's good to see you again. Uh, it is a true honor to be here 
and thank you for the invitation. I will note also, this is perhaps the most diverse conference I've been at in a long time. Uh, it's unusual for me to be a minority at a conference, especially in the United States, and good on you, Colette, for doing that. Uh, it's really appreciated. Pleasure. Uh, at the start, I got to use my usual disclaimer. My comments are my views alone. They do not represent the U.S. Air Force Academy, the Air Force, the U.S. government, or any other agency you can think of in any possible way. Uh, what I want to talk about is our effort, my co-author, uh, Lynn Chandler Garcia, and our team's effort, which was to bring something called EAAA, which is a sexual assault prevention program, to the U.S. Air Force Academy. And essentially, the challenge is this. How do we bring an empirically validated, validated sexual assault prevention program to USAFA? That's how you say the U.S. Air Force Academy's uh, acronym. Um, this was a no kidding challenge, and it's a no kidding challenge because of the reality at the Air Force Academy. Uh, as many of you might know, particularly U.S. Uh, based citizens, the Academy in 2003 had one of the worst sexual assault um, crises. Uh, publicly kind of aired in front of the nation. Uh, a series of women came out, uh, female cadets, saying they were sexual assaulted over the years, and the academy covered it up. Uh, since 2003, there's been a concerted, very public effort to reduce uh, uh, the level, obviously, of sexual assault with the goal of getting it to zero at the academy. We have failed at that effort. Um, assault levels have risen for the longest time. They said, well, the rise in assault levels is a good thing because that says that people feel free to uh, share their experiences and report their experiences. Well, over the last two years, we both have reporting going up as well as a uh, number of assaults. So those are the arrows in the wrong directions in both areas there. Uh, reporting is not going down. Uh, assaults are also going up. For instance, since 2017, at my institution, 15.1% of the female cadets reported un experiencing un unwanted sexual contact. 5.5% experienced complete penetration. About 95% of the offenders were male and 63% were cadets. Um, our goal was to bring an evidence-based sexual assault prevention program to the academy, but how do we do that at the same time as balancing cadet privacy and the rights they have? At the Air Force Academy, there is uh, some unique challenges. And for those of you who are not kind of aware of military life or life at a military academy, um, the service academies, uh, West Point is most commonly known as West uh, Naval Academy, Coast Guard Academy, and Air Force Academy all pretty much look the same in a lot of ways. Cadets are massed in either one or two very, very large dorms. Um, depending on what year they are, they have very few privileges. On the one hand, it almost seems like they have no privacy whatsoever. Cadets are subject to things like drug tests, as you might imagine. Or they have what we call Saturday uh, AM inspections, uh, or SAMIs as they're dreaded as. Uh, everything in their dorm rooms they can go through. And sometimes that can be um, embarrassing for cadets, depending on the situation. If you think about things like contraceptives and things like that, which they're allowed to have, now being aired in front of their superiors. Um, so. The common language that cadets often say is they don't have a home while they're at USAFA. Uh, everything is an open. On the other hand, though, uh, the military writ large and the military academies have thought about privacy a great deal. And in some ways, in kind of perverse ways sometimes, they privilege uh, privacy. For instance, for those familiar with the US system, uh, think about don't ask, don't tell. It's in essence saying you can be gay if you want to in the military. You have that right private right, just don't share it with anyone else or we're gonna kick you out. Um, I would argue the same kind of logic right now is applying with this administration, with this for you today. Uh, you can be transgender is basically the uh, administration's policy, um, but we can't know that you are and don't apply for any rights or things like that. Kind of, a, I'd argue a perverse way of looking at privacy. I will say at the Air Force Academy though, uh, IRB uh, going to our last presentation um, is ad, uh, has done a remarkable job in enforcing like an iron law. Cadets are not to be used for guinea pigs on experiments. Uh, research is opportunities for cadets. For example, we have driverless cars, like a lot of places do, but we do them to, as an opportunity for uh, cadets to join research, to see, get trust in automated 
uh, technology and things like that, uh, but it's not forced on them. Research has to be something that, uh, like any other ethical research is done, is that the, the subject volunteers for, and we, we hold to that. So, you know, how do I bring, and I'll talk about in a second what EAAA is, this program, which is designed to gather data on cadets and seeing how well they're doing and learning different types of methods and preventions and rip, uh, rape myths going down and things like that. How do I do that in a way that kind of fits with the ethical part of IRB and ethical part of privacy? How do we do that? Uh, briefly, the program we're looking to bring in is a remarkable program, and I hope all your institutions, if you have any of these problems, would take a look at it. It was developed by Charlene Sen. Um, she's at the University of Windsor in uh, Canada, and it's a combination of a bunch of different programs, but quite simply, uh, it's uh, drawn on uh, ecological models of women's responses to sexual assaults. It's a four-course program where basically it, asks, uh, it teaches people to assess, acknowledge, the risk of sexual assault, and if necessary, defend themselves. There's even a physical component of an innuendo. One of the reasons we're a big fan of the program is uh, it is empirically based. Uh, probably her most famous study, and there are many, was published by a little journal called the New England Journal of Medicine, whereby uh, she, her program in a college campus uh, reduced rape uh, from a range of 58, I'm sorry, reduced completed rape at 58.2%. It's simply a remarkable number, um, and there's no other program like that. We're seeing retention in rape myth reductions of, uh, lasting at a minimum of two years. Uh, it ranges at 71.8%, and I would argue right now it's probably the gold standard for sexual assault reduction programs. So briefly, what would be the challenges of bringing this to the Air Force Academy? Well, as I mentioned before, how do you make this voluntary versus non-voluntary? We have lots of SAPR sexual assault prevention and reduction programs that are non-voluntary. I have to go to them. There's no choice involved to that. But as soon as I add, you know, not just a military requirement, but I add a research component on that, I have to make it voluntary. So how do I get cadets to the opportunity to opt in when they're hyper, hyper scheduled already and they probably don't want to opt into anything, let alone a course they haven't heard of before? Um, they're pragmatic concerns. I'll just outline these very, very briefly here. Um, cadets literally have a 47 month curriculum. That's how we think about it. Every day, every hour, virtually every minute is accounted for. Um, each of the mission elements from athletics to military to education all want a piece of that. If I'm going to put EAAA training in there uh, and I get uh, Yusafa to agree on that, something has to come out. I've got to make a case that EAAA training is more important than maybe jump, where they jump out of planes by themselves. So I got to make a case that's more important than another sexual assault training. Um, there are minutia things that really, really matter. Uh, uniforms. We have lots of different uniforms we wear. Uh, the standard uniform looks like a camouflage uniform, but that's not appropriate for EAAA training. They do some physical combatives in that when no training, and I need them in a PT or a physical training uh, outfit. Well, I'm taking only female cadets, which I'll talk about next, of a certain year group, and I'm having them wear a different uniform during the day. That pops. I mean, it pops out like almost like you're naked walking around. So what are the harms in doing that and singling out a group? Uh, we really had to weigh that carefully there and how do we get around that? Um, our training is only for females. It's only for female freshmen initially and then be for female upperclassmen. Um, a lot of equity questions there, right? Right. Uh, why are we putting another burden just on the most vulnerable population we have on this? Um, why not offer it for men? And I can talk about that in Q&A if you'd like to on that. And lastly, most directly here is privacy and trust. I'll put in the last bucket here and I'll uh, pull that together. Um, last two ones, I'm sorry. Privacy and trust. Um, data storage is real, right? Doing those concerns and gathering that. That wasn't too hard. Uh, HIPAA standards are being followed and things like that um, and gathering and working with IRB on that and big DOD was pretty simple there. But I got to talk about the types of questions that our surveys to do post and pretest, pre, I'm sorry, pretest and post-test do and why it's a real challenge. Uh, for instance, I'll ask about drinking on the survey. It's part of the standard kind of thing. How often do you drink? Uh, do you use drugs? Do you use marijuana? Do things like that? Where cadets are all subject to a version of UCMNJ, the universe, uh, Universal Code of Military Conduct. By answering those questions and saying, yes, I drank and I'm underage, 
that has no kidding consequences to them. Or yes, I did drugs, I did marijuana, that's no kidding consequences. And that can be something like quite literally a $400,000 hit you owe the government and you're kicked out now. Um, I gotta gather that data and I gotta have them be honest about that answer. So how do I do that? That was a real hurdle. And the answer, the bottom line on, on that is trust and that's gonna flow both directions. I'll, I'll end on that in a second. And the last point I'd have we had a real hurdle with is actually sex. I, I have a very conservative institution where I am. As you might imagine, uh, the area is very conservative as well. And we, part of the, the training is this, is to uh, have cadets acknowledge the types of choices they wanna make before they're in a position to make those choices. So for instance, do you wanna have oral sex? Is that something that's in your vocabulary of things you want to do at some point, given a relationship? We want you to think about that now. And you make decisions that are consistent with your value judgment. We're not going to get in the business of what your value judgment is. But when I do that in a very conservative institution, you can imagine some of the responses I, I might get. Um, so I'll just end on this, Clint, and I'll, I'll go back over to you. Um, trust is just absolutely seminal on making any of this work. I need to trust from my leadership uh, that they would write down literally on a piece of paper that matters, legal piece of paper vetted by JAGS, that they would never ask for any of the data I was collecting. I had to make sure I de-identified de in such a way I couldn't give it to them even if they did ask. Uh, but I wanted to have that on a piece of paper so I could show that to the cadets as well. This can never be held against you despite these other things. And yes, um, the judge advocate generals have signed off on all that. Um, I need to trust my leadership. I need to trust from our cadets and trust for our team. Um, and that takes a long time to build. So this has been about a three-year uh, project. I'll stop there because I know I'm at my over. Thank you very much, Colette. Over to you. Thank you, John. Thank you very, very much indeed for that presentation. It's now my pleasure to turn to Professor Mary Kate Schneider at the Loyola University, Maryland, who is going to discuss uh, ethics of personal data collection in the context of an initiative in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Thank you so much, Mary Kay, for joining us. Thank you, Colette, for having me here. Uh, so this chapter is based on work that I did for a much larger project assessing high school students' social attitudes in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And I am also going to talk uh, a little bit about trust and the importance of trust building um, with respect to the ethics of personal data collection. So, um, just for a little bit of context here, Bosnia-Herzegovina was the site of violent identity-based conflict in the 1990s, and so now it falls into this category of post-conflict spaces. Um, and a post-conflict space is, among other things, a space in which reconciliation remains an ongoing process rather than a met goal. And so the main question that this chapter addresses is, how ought one to conduct research in post-conflict spaces? So there are a host of special considerations related to data collection in post-conflict spaces. Uh, namely, research participants may face grave threats to their physical security should their personally identifying information be exposed. Um, and I think that we've already talked quite a bit about kind of um, de-identifying information and maintaining confidentiality. Um, but furthermore, Participation in research may be triggering to participants who have experienced primary, secondary, or collective trauma as a result of the conflict. And so this is one of the things that makes research in post-conflict spaces a little bit unique. So with this in mind, um, I'll talk a little bit about my project um, and then talking about some of the major issues that came up um, through my project um, with respect to personal data collection. So my project, as I mentioned, um, was a project assessing high school students' social attitudes, um, Bosnian high school students. And so to do that, I employed a tripartite methodology in which I conducted a series of surveys, written surveys, as well as some focus groups um, and some interviews. And so in the chapter, I talk mostly about the survey component of the research. Um, my subjects were high school juniors and seniors, so third and fourth year high school students in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, drawn from six different schools. And so you might be asking kind of why are we interested in this particular population? What's so interesting about high school students in Bosnia-Herzegovina? Well, at the time that I was conducting the research, um, these students would have been born in 1995, 96, 97. Um, and so these students were 
very much the first post-war generation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and so they reflect kind of a unique population that didn't have any direct memories of the conflict itself. They didn't, they didn't live through the war, they were born after the war. Um, but they also didn't have any memories of multi-ethnic Yugoslavia and what life was like before the war. And so I was really lucky to be able to conduct this research at a really interesting moment in time, um, being able to survey this population um, that, that is in many ways kind of a blank slate um, for Bosnia Herzegovina. And so um, this allowed me to kind of um, get at the question of interethnic relations within the country and um, the post-conflict or post-war um, milieu in, in a different way than I would have been able to had I been looking at other cases. Um, so that's why third and fourth year high school students. Um, the survey questions that I asked were focused mainly on issues of identity, ethnicity, questions about discrimination, and social distance. And that is social distance, um, as Emery Bogardis um, meant it, not social distance in the context that we um, use that term today. So, um, for example, to, to what extent would you mind or not mind if someone belonging to a different group um, were to marry a close family member? Um, things like, questions like that, right? Um, so, I deployed the surveys within students' classrooms. Um, and that right there kind of um, raised some questions for me about how voluntary students' participation actually was. And so I, I took great pains to kind of emphasize and reiterate the voluntariness of the survey, um, that the survey was something that they were, con that they were completing um, for my benefit and not for the benefit of their grades, not um, at the behest of their teacher, et cetera, et cetera. And so I tried to take care um, to, to really, really emphasize over and over again that the survey was voluntary and not um, something that they would be punished for not participating in. Um, so that was kind of issue number one. Um, broader issues relate to issues of trauma and trust. And so, if we kind of zoom out away from Bosnia and Herzegovina and we talk about post conflict spaces more generally, um, mentioned trauma a couple of minutes ago. Collective trauma in particular um, afflicts Bosnia and Herzegovina. And so there's this real sense of collective trauma um, embedded in society in Bosnia and Herzegovina even today. Um, and so, in light of this collective trauma, I had to be really careful about the wording of questions and the wording of conversation topics um, and steering the conversation within focus groups um, so as to avoid triggering trauma responses in my survey, I'm sorry, my research participants. Um, so trauma was a concern um, and trauma is a concern in any post-conflict space. Um, another issue, trust. And as we've discussed already, trust is critical in human subjects research. Um, and this applies not only to trust between the researcher and research subjects, right, um, but also between the research community writ large and the research population, um, trust amongst research institutions and between sponsors, institutional review boards and the general public, right? So there's not just this sort of bilateral trust relationship that you're building when you engage in a research project with human subjects, but think of it in terms of a network. Um, a network of trust. And so some of the things that I discuss in my chapter, uh, building on work that, that Resnick has done on trust building and research, um, I discuss some best practices in building trust. And so one of the things that I think is, is really important um, is that researchers should, should is not the right word, researchers must avoid a sense of entitlement to subjects' personal data um, subjects are effectively doing researchers a service by sharing their stories, by sharing their personal data. And I think that sometimes um, we as researchers forget about that um, or, or we run the risk of forgetting about that. And so I think it's important to remember and to keep in mind that um, none of us are entitled to our subjects data. Um, another thing that is important that's already been discussed today is establishing a credible guarantee of confidentiality. And how that guarantee is made credible is gonna vary from case to case and situation to situation, um, but it's important. Additionally, 
um, and we've already discussed this today, detailed consent statements matter. These are important. Um, not just kind of presenting the consent statement to your research subjects and assuming that they'll read it and understand it on their own, but really kind of walking through it with them so that they do understand um, they do understand the meaning of the consent or assent statement that's being used. And finally, last but not least, uh, in terms of best practices in trust building, demonstrating a commitment to the local community on the part of the researcher um, or the researcher's institution is important. And so if you're going out into the field and you're an outsider, right, um, in addition to avoiding a sense of entitlement to subjects' personal data, um, you have to think about kind of what that looks like on the other end. Um, and, you know, establishing the why should I for research participants to participate, particularly in post-conflict spaces, particularly in spaces that have experienced societal trauma is important. And so some sort of commitment um, to the local community, either by yourself individually as a researcher or by your research institution is important to trust building. So ultimately in the chapter, I argue that the question of how one ought to conduct research in post-conflict settings um, is one that I think we should first start to answer by developing deep familiarity with the cases in question. Um, and the specific ethical issues that will arise in each situation are, are going to be idiosyncratic to the case at hand. Um, but consideration of broader issues, I think, um, including things like ethical challenges inherent to permission, consent, implicit bias, outsider status, um, new, excuse me, neutrality and objectivity, um, and last but not least, the question of who benefits from research. Um, I think that those concepts provide a strong starting point going forward to how to develop best practices for conducting research in post-conflict spaces. So I'll conclude there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Kate, very much indeed for that presentation. It's now my pleasure to turn to Professor Emerita C.N. Hollyfield, the Grady School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Georgia. Anne and I uh, have the distinction of having been members of uh, the Bosch Foundation Fellowship uh, community, going on almost 30 years now uh, of our association together, I'm, I'm delighted to say. Uh, it's indeed a, a treasure of a friendship and uh, a professional association uh, as well. Uh, as you've heard in, in these presentations, we've been concerned with leadership. We've been concerned with agency and specifically limits that may be placed on agency as the result of the, the collection and the aggregation and the uses or misuses of personal data. And Anne has been brought in as an editor with me and uh, James Felton Keith on this initial volume in the Anthem Press series because of her very long career as a scholar, as a journalist, uh, as an astute observer of these issues uh, and as an advocate on behalf of those who are adversely implicated. And I think that it's very, very important that we have a holistic appreciation of what we are trying to do with this volume in our focus on governments and our focus on human data on human subjects research that we not leave out also attention to corporations. And so I've asked Anne to say a few words as we uh, close today about these subjects. Anne, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colette. And thank you, James. I'm very honored that uh, Colette and James invited me to edit the book with them. And I have been reading most of the chapters. I've read most of the chapters that you've submitted so far. And not only are they excellent, but they've certainly gotten me thinking quite a bit. As Colette mentioned, um, my field is in journalism and academia. And I started the first program in, I think, around the globe, but certainly in the United States, to teach students to become professional media analysts, data analytics, do data analytics for media corporations and advertising. And we did that actually at the behest of the industry. They were talking about how much they needed people with those skills. So I'm going to come to share some of my thoughts with you that have come up as I've read the various chapters. Um, and hopefully we'll spur some thinking and, and more dialogue as we go forward. In the chapters that have been submitted and that I've had the, the chance to read so far, there are two overarching themes. 
And one is the role of government in data, uh, data collection and data abuse and the uses that government, both positive and negative, can make of data. And the other is uh, such the presentations we've heard recently about IRB and the use of data protection, data trust uh, in research. And I think that there is a um, element here that is very worth thinking about, and Professor Akkar talked about it a little bit, so but some of my comments will overlap with his. And that is that the vast majority of data that are being collected today are not being collected by government, and it's certainly not being connected by researchers like us. They are being collected by corporations. Raise your hand if you're aware that Every time you get into your car, if your car was purchased sometime in the 21st century, your car is weighing you, recording how much many pounds you've gained or lost since the last time you got in it, and transferring that information to the car manufacturer who then sells it. I don't see any hands coming up. <laughs> how many of you know that if you're using an iPhone like I do and you have Siri turned on, Siri is eavesdropping on every conversation that you're, you're having with your husband in the bedroom about products that you're using and transferring that to advertisements. And you're highly likely to get an, an advertisement about that product on your Facebook feed or in your email box within 30 minutes of the conversation. Okay, <laughs> right, okay. I teach this stuff and I research this stuff and I can sit here today and tell you that I have absolutely no idea how much of our private data is being collected. So if I don't know this, what is someone who with a high school education going to know about it? And if they don't know about it, if they don't understand what data are being collected on them and being sold, how can they possibly give you informed consent on anything? And so, I mean, I think there are a lot of issues here. I'm not gonna have time to talk about all of them, but I wanna throw a bunch of them out for you to think about. And um, hopefully we'll also be addressing in the conclusion of the book and possibly also in a chapter. First of all, um, data have two values that we, uh, that are very important, particularly if I'm not an IR, but all of you are, that are relevant to the work that you do. Data have a commodity value. In fact, the amount of money, the value of the data you give to a company when it asks you for your zip code when you buy a candy bar in a store is more valuable to them than the, actually the money they get from you in, when you pay them for that candy bar. Okay, because they're collecting that and they're selling it. So data now is one of the most valuable products that every company from your gas station to your retailer collects on you and sells. It's more valuable in many ways than the products they sell. But data also are incredibly valuable because they are the fuel that drives every other economic process. And so they are critical in government and politics as a necessary element in any country that cares to have a globally competitive economy. And that means there's going to be enormous pressure brought to bear on politicians to not regulate the collection and sale of private data. Um, data are currently being used. There, there's a new, new element to the data industry that's cropping up, not just data aggregators like Axiom that can tell a, a marketer how many square feet you have in your apartment and what your appliances are. But there also now are companies that are popping up that are taking all of those data that companies like Axiom are, are gathering and they are assigning a score to you. And that score is then being sold to people who are looking at, you're trying to rent an apartment from or employers who are um, considering you for a job. And you don't know that, that those scores exist. You don't know what goes into them. You don't know the algorithms that are collecting them. And again, think about what this means for vulnerable populations. Um, we are already seeing, I think, you know, we've talked about regulation a lot today. Dr. Akbar had, uh, Akkar had, a lot, had some very important things to say about that. But I think we also need to be aware that, as I said, government's interests increasingly are actually aligning with those of corporations that are collecting these data. For example, in the United States, we know already that many law enforcement agencies are no longer going to courts to get wiretap and warrants. They're simply going to these third party companies and buying the data because they can get exactly the same thing and they don't have to go through the court processes. It's an end run around civil rights and constitutional protections, but they're buying data that under the American laws was legally collected and is legally sold in the current environment. 
Um, I frankly think that we're going to see social science researchers starting to do the same thing. And I think um, I'll, I'll defer to uh, Professor uh, Andrea about this, but I'm going to think that it's going to be a great lawsuit as to whether or not a university IRB can tell a social science researcher that they cannot use data bought commercially when that data were legally, those data were legally collected and are being legally sold. So obviously that doesn't affect projects where you're in a place like Bosnia Herzegovina doing a very limited and targeted data collection, but in terms of large data sets, why not? And then in that context, speaking to the informed consent and trust aspects, what does informed consent mean again in these vulnerable populations when, these, when people don't know what data are being collected or what the implications of them are, for example, these scoring systems. Additionally, if you look at most of the commercial software and apps that we're using, all of them have terms of use agreements. You cannot function in the 21st century without accessing things like Microsoft Word and Adobe Acrobat, PDF files, and many of these apps. And yet, if you look at the terms of agreement, it's take it or leave it. You can't go through and strike out the line that says, and we're going to just collect and sell your data, right? So what does informed consent mean when the, the question is, you either, if you wanna use our software, you have to consent, and you also have to agree not to sue no matter what we do with your data and how you're harmed by that, because that's also in those legal agreements. And on top of that, if you don't consent, you can't use our data, even though you're paying us to buy our software, even though you're paying us to buy that software, you can't use it and you can't function in the 21st century knowledge economy without access to software and apps. So all of these are questions that come up again when we think about both um, government and researchers eventually accessing these data. Um, and uh, another thing to think about, which I think has real IR implications as well is what's happening with these data and how these data are being combined with cutting edge neuroscience research and cutting edge psychology research. So the best case study of this to be aware of was the President Barack Obama's campaign because his campaign in 2012 and 2000, uh, his campaigns actually perfected this technique. They buy these data sets these giant data sets from uh, these data aggregators, and they parse them. And, and the head of research for Google said at a conference I attended that probably by the time the election rolled around, the uh, Obama campaign had identified every single American who was a definite or likely or even possible voter in the United States for Barack Obama. And when their campaign canvassers went door to door, they knew before they rang your doorbell who you were, what kinds of things were meaningful issues to you, and which of the 12 or 20 messages the campaign had, to, had developed, you and your spouse were likely to individually respond to, and those were the messages that the campaign came canvasser standing on your doorstep delivered to you. Okay, so we're seeing that writ large in the current election in terms of manipulation, the ability to manipulate people, and the implications for that. And last but not least, um, I'm gonna, I know I'm running out of time, but from an IR standpoint, there's this. Obviously, e the EU has done a much better job of regulating data as has the state of California. But if we look at history and the deregulation of telecommunications, and we go back to what I was talking about, about the two types of economic value that data have, both commodity and as a fuel for the economy, the history suggests to us that asymmetrical national regulation or even regional regulation of data is not going to survive. And the simple reason is, uh, the example was that the United States deregulated AT&T and its telecommunication systems and within a decade, virtually every other country in the world was forced to do the same thing because of the economically competitive advantage that created for US corporations through the decade of the 80s and the early 90s. And so I think we're going to see that um, no matter how hard nations and regions try to deal with these issues and protect citizens, there's going to be an enormous economic force uh, working on it, along with political forces and governmental forces because of governments and politicians' interest in having access to these data that's going to really work against regulating the privacy concerns and the protecting citizens. So I'll stop there because I'm over time. Thank you, Colette. No, thank you, Anne, indeed, uh, for those closing remarks. 
We do have some time for questions and answers uh, before we close. Are there any uh, in the group that would either like to pose a question or offer some comments on anything that has been shared by our speaker? Somi, please go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you. I think this is more of a general question from the first panel to like everybody. Um, but Professor Collette, you did mention something about leadership to interrupt oppression in the beginning. And then um, Jasmine, you talked about your country and I thought it was very similar to Korea. And the thing is, I think what they did well with this COVID is that they made the virus visible by tracking everybody and by tracking the virus. But at the same time, at least for Korea, that created discrimination that was, I would say already existed, but it gave people reason and, and data to point fingers at certain groups. And unfortunately, it was mostly, uh, there were a lot of cases in gay clubs during when the pandemic was quite serious and they had a lot of bullying and a lot of shame publicly. And they were also forced to give up their personal information if they were there because that's kind of the law. So some people who were not ready to come out were kind of forced to come out. And then they got shame from that. And I was just wondering, like, data is, like, there's quite a bit of transparency in, in the government. And, and there's a lot of data out there. And the media just eats up all the data. And everyone knows about it. And I think the, pop, the more educated the population is, they're willing to use it in certain ways. But if we're talking about leadership to interrupt oppression, how do you find the balance? How should a leader or a government find the balance between uh, getting data for the safety of the public, but at the same time, you know, interrupting the bad usage of such data? Well, thank you for that question, Somi, because I think that, you know, Jasmine had spoken in the context of Taiwan about identity and particularly about democracy. And I think that your question is going to the heart of really the, the democratic uh, government and the democratic way of life. Uh, and the way you posed it is in a particularly sensitive way, particularly when we consider the impact on marginalized populations. Um, Jasmine, from the, from the Taiwanese context, would you have anything that you might want to share in response to Solmi's question, bringing, of course, uh, Korea in uh, as well from her vantage point? Sorry, could you uh, repeat your question because I haven't, I, I didn't hear it that clearly, sorry. Uh, so, me, so perhaps just, to, I don't want a phrase for you, but I mean, essentially you're asking about leadership and the mm -hmm. question of how leadership is responsive on the one hand to the needs to, shall we say, um, address the challenges the pandemic has brought about but yet also the concerns that you are uh, expressing with regard to populations that would be targeted in that process. Am I, mm -hmm. am I, yeah, okay. Do you understand the question, dear? Yes, um, it make, I, I, in Taiwan's response to the COVID-19, there is a really important um, measure that Taiwanese government uses that they, uh, they form the CECC Central Epidemic Command Center, and they allow that let the um, people in Taiwan to cons to be informed all the time with the, all the governmental measures, and that they let the the one that people really trust to inform people. And I think that's really important in in fighting COVID pandemic. And you can see in the US, even though lots of people, they do trust uh, Fauci, Dr. Fauci, but there's another part of people, they have questioned on them they could, due to maybe due to some um, misinformation or disinformation. But I think in the democratic country, it's really important to, um, to ensure the transparency and let the people that people trust uh, that a person that people trust to inform people. Yes. I think part of the concern, Solmi, and I think this is, you know, when I, I listen to Professor Hollyfield speaking, I think what this uh, Personal Data Day Summit has done is for some raised the awareness that some of the abuses are built into the design of the way in which we work with these products, 
the way in which the uh, entire system is evolving. Shoshana Zuboff uses the term instrumentarian power. I think what uh, Ziad has brought up is that we have to think about power now in, in the ways in which it is evolving. And I think that that's something which is particularly important for IR, but it's also necessary to think about in the context of democracies. Uh, trust is essential. The difficulty is that you can try uh, your best to engender trust, but if, if within the design uh, of a particular platform, or if within the process of uh, aggregating data, there is already something built in, which is inherently manipulative, which is inherently um, inappropriate, then that has to be addressed. And I think what Professor Hollyfield said about uh, governments seeming to be more inclined over time to align themselves more with the firms uh, and, and the implications of that, that we have to consider very carefully. Um, Anne, did you want to add um, anything? Yeah, please. Just briefly, because I think the um, COVID examples that have been shared from Taiwan, from uh, Korea, and from Italy are excellent examples of the good use, governmental use of data to deal with uh, a, a national and international crisis. In the United States, we have the exact opposite. We have the government who is um, using data very, very thoughtfully to actually deceive the public. And they are literally burying cases. They're disappearing in here in Georgia, the state of Georgia, the state government is going back into records from October, March, April, May, and making deaths from COVID disappear. So the total death rate is dropping. So there's a very conscious, knowledgeable uh, effort from government to use data to deceive the public, which is ruining that long-term trust, but it also has implications for what we know about data in society. You know, and I, and I think, again, this comes back to leadership, Somi, and that's why we bring it up. Uh, it's why we feel we must address it. I am cognizant of the time, James. We're at 2.59. We want to be respectful that we agreed to close at 3 p.m. It remains for me to thank each and every one of you for joining us today, uh, either as presenters, as members of the Conflict Resolution Seminar at New York University, those members in Colombia uh, joining us from the International Relations in the Post-Cold War Era NYU Seminar as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to be uh, exchanging ideas and sharing insights with you all, and we look forward to doing this again uh, in the near future. All the best. James, over to you, please, uh, 259. Uh, we have a little bit of time if you want. But the next panel isn't until 3.30. I thought that this might run long. <laughs> so, and, and I, I mean, it, it's been extraordinary in how concise everyone has been. Um, so I mean, maybe if you all want to take a few extra questions, feel free to. I just want to say, again, thank you in general. Uh, I always feel like in front of your students, I just, Professor Mazzuccelli <laughs> is, is just drop dead brilliant, uh, to say it in a very plain way. Uh, early, early on when we were all in DC having these conversations, and I think like Suzanne was there and Elsa was there and, and, a, and a few others was there, Zaya was there. I remember people from the, from the standard data conversation asked me sort of, what does all this have to do with the data conversation? And the, the, the simple answer is it has everything to do, this is the actual conversation. This book, I think, will be more influential in changing the landscape of how we consider uh, the collection of the evidence of our lives, which we're calling personal data today, but we may call something else tomorrow. And it will be the primary way that we serve to include ourselves in whatever our societies may be. And I just want to say personally, as I'm fascinated with every single one of these um, submissions for the book, I cannot, I just have not yet wrapped my head around uh, Jasmine's uh, writing and what's happening in, in Taiwan or as a result of how daunting China is. 
and in a and incentivizing that that uh, cultural sect, for lack of better phrases, to, to come together, and I'm it's just it's mind blowing. So I'm just I'm a fan. I'm just nerding out. I'm, I feel like all the the students here, and um, I'm gonna shut up. But if, <laughs> if, if you'd like to do a few more, the the next conversation is uh, is, is at three thirty, and. Uh, we realized we actually had some technological uh, snafus early on, so we're going to re-release all the videos on social media, et cetera, so people can see the conversations that lead into this. I will say the very next book coming out on the in the series that uh, Professor Mazzuccelli and I edit, uh, and now uh, um, Anne uh, edits, is, uh, is I think a really extraordinary exploration of what human rights has evolved into. These are two philosophers um, out of Switzerland uh, who have a whole lot to say around the web that we live in and, mm -hmm. and how we exist as people who have tangible evidence of our existence. And it really disrupts the standard way in which we consider how we develop policy and sovereign states and international relations uh, as a result. And um, there's so much going on. 2021 will truly be a new era uh, per these publications, and um, I'm exhausted today, <laughs> but I'm excited about it, about everything. So that's that's all I have. Thank you, thank thank you, just everybody. Thank you. Thank you, James. First and foremost, for organizing this entire summit. Uh, it is an edifying experience uh, and an exhausting one, uh, I'm sure, for you having had to bring uh, together panels from early this morning until late this afternoon, which is a significant, uh, an ex significant endeavor. Uh, I am cognizant of the fact that we are three minutes over time for the conflict resolution seminar. And to be respectful of the students' time, I do not want to hold them here. Uh, that being said, uh, we do have colleagues in the room. I see uh, Professor Whitney Leah is still here. Professor Adams, I believe, is still here. A number of us are here. We are delighted to stay on a little bit while longer uh, if there are questions or to have discussion, uh, by all means. I simply do not want to force uh, those in the conflict resolution seminar uh, who are really in class with us today. This is part of the regular class. I don't want to force them uh, to stay online, particularly those joining us from Paris and other locations where it is getting to be rather late in the evening. Uh, that being said, uh, if there are questions or comments that you would like to raise, we do have a little bit more time and uh, we're happy to continue the dialogue. We don't always get to see each other uh, together in a group as often as we would like. It's always such a pleasure. Uh, every face is a memory. And I see so many familiar faces here, uh, smiling faces, and that pleases me so much. So are there questions or comments that uh, you would have about anything that's been shared or even something that might have been raised that triggers uh, for you, uh, something that you're interested particularly to explore? Anyone? Anyone? Let's see here. Am I seeing everyone? I think I am. I think I am. James, we've been on for quite a while. I'm not sure if, uh, you know, there are going to be other questions. Three hours in a virtual conference, as you know, is quite a long time, even for those of us who are happy to do it. Ziad, are you raising your hand or simply? <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I'd be happy to make a comment that I wanted Please, to make earlier. Please, by all means, Ziad, um, go ahead. By just, all just to tackle on this issue of leadership and, and governments, I think one of the one of the interesting things when you think about public health crises or even national security crises is how quickly governments and people are willing to shed certain rights. So we've seen it after 9-11 in the US, Patriot Act got passed, 20 years later, it's still pretty much enforced. Um, the question I have now um, is similarly with this public health crisis that we're going through. Um, and while there's been many good cases of use of contact tracing, there's been cases where in the US and in the UK and in potentially in Canada where the, the, the software, the applications actually don't particularly do a good job. So they're not particularly helpful from a public health perspective. Um, and we've made all these exceptions for them. And so how long, you know, we have a bad reputation when it comes to government to actually kind of closing the, the loopholes and closing 
um, ending regulations that we've put in place for temporary or emergency cases, they have a habit of becoming kind of, they're sticking with us for decades to go. Um, and so I think one of the risks that I see now with COVID um, and contact tracing and all this data collection, you know, everybody who has an iPhone probably noticed that you have now a contact, a corona, you know, just setting for corona exposure and you have to turn it on. And so how much, how long would these kind of tools remain in place? Um, and, you know, I think that's one of the big issues when it comes to leadership and regulation is we often just don't take back, you know, the, the, this kind of surveillance uh, that we put in place for health, for health or security reasons after the actual emergency passes. No, and I think what you're saying, Ziad, comes back to what Anne was saying, that we're having an end run around constitutional, uh, shall we say, concerns. And, you know, this is something where uh, if it's not COVID-19, is it the next pandemic? Is it the next crisis? I mean, what are we looking towards? I think we're looking towards something where uh, the new normal is just going to keep changing. And how many uh, rights and, and freedoms will we sacrifice without ever being asked to? Because so much of this is um, insidious. And I think if I, if I take something from Professor Hollyfield's comments, it's that you know, there, there is no informed consent. It's, you know, you take it or you go to hell. And unfortunately, you know, you have to take it because your life may depend on it. Uh, you, need, you need these um, services, healthcare services. You need to be able to use certain platforms. I mean, we're in a world again now where, as we know, in the 21st century, um, choices are increasingly limited in terms of what you turn down. And I think we are, we are in many ways being co-opted uh, into the future. And that's, that's concerning. Uh, it, it's, it's scary in many ways. But for us as researchers, it has to be concerning because it's, it's, it's also about you know, the vocation of, of the university and the vocation of, of researchers in the university is to respect, um, to respect the data. And I think this is something which Mary Kate Schneider brought up. Um, we sometimes uh, lose track of this. And that's also a concern, Ziad. Uh, I think it, it's a concern that we have to uh, factor in as we realize that you know, the university is only a small part of a much larger uh, set of issues, but it is a part of those issues. And, and we have to have a voice. We have to be aware of the challenges that we face. Uh, and, and we have to be relevant still to the society. And I think many of us are asking, how do we remain relevant? How do we remain relevant in these changing times? Uh, how, do we, how do we contribute? in a sense, to the, to the public discourse. And this is something James and I have talked about a lot. Uh, the Anthem Press series is not meant to be just another academic series. It's meant really to be uh, a shaper of public discourse. We want to be involved in, in the narrative uh, that's being created. And I think what James is doing uh, here, what each of these researchers is doing, you know, Suzanne mentioned it when she talked about uh, Safe City and the whole purpose of Safe City. There is truly a dominant narrative, and in, and in many ways, we're, we're called to challenge that narrative. We're called to challenge that narrative is part of what I meant when I opened with um, interrupting oppression. And, and I think that each one of us um, feels that responsibility. We feel that responsibility, um, and we are dedicated to making a difference uh, in a modest way. Um, these issues are just so large. Um, it does take a village. And I think what we're creating here uh, is a, a community of, of dedicated researchers and students and, and uh, those who, who have a sincere desire to not only uh, suggest answers or suggest solutions, but to know the questions to raise. And sometimes that's more difficult. Sometimes it, it is more difficult to know the questions to ask. Um, you know, it, it's, it's somewhat easier to say, I have the solution or this is the answer. Um, sometimes you just have to be willing to step back and in all modesty and in all humility, realize that there are so many questions that are left unasked and that need to be asked. Um, and then that's the world uh, that we live in. Um, I saw a hand, Suzanne, please go ahead. Yeah. Suzanne, you're muted, dear. Sorry, too many hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But uh, I just wanted to say that I, you know, really just applaud what you just said. Um, I'm so, you know, excited to be a part of this and, you know, to add other things to this collection that help us to see and ask what we don't ask and hear from, most importantly, hear from the people that we don't hear from. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, one thing that struck me in all this um, discussion, um, and, you know, he's, he's had to go, um, but uh, John Riley over at uh, USAFA, um, and, you know, the way that he navigated the complexities of, you know, a very complex system um, of, you know, just hierarchy and uh, ways of doing things. And, you know, in that particular culture, um, you know, standards of doing things that are, you know, rigid for many reasons. Um, but yet he managed to navigate all that to effect a genuine informed consent to a project that honestly, when I first heard about it, you know, as an academic researcher that works with IRBs and such, I was like, we're doing what now? Um, but, you know, I trust, you know, I know you and I know um, James that, you know, I know, you know, you guys are really outside the box thinkers. And, you know, so I'm like, all right, you know, let me, let me plug in and see, you know, where this is going. And, um, you know, and it's really a brilliant um, twist on a very complicated problem. And you need outside of the box thinking, you know, with, complicated, wicked problems. Um, and the way that he's been able to navigate um, that informed consent process within that kind of a structure in a really effective way offers, for me at least, some hope that, you know, maybe there's ways, you know, to model how this could be done so that, you know, other parts of the data worlds that are more private and governmental might be made to, um, you know, adjust. Instead, they're battling, um, you know, one of the reasons we brought um, Andrea was that we encountered, we couldn't put our app back on Google because we were collecting um, personal level data and they said, you know, you've got to have some kind of procedure here. And that's, you know, yeah. where she began engaging, you know, an informed consent process. But a lot of the big players in that field are now trying to stand Google down for even wanting to have something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. I, I didn't know that that was how you all and Andrea uh, linked together. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn, but yeah, I also- No, no, go ahead, James, go. What, what no, John is doing in that structure is extraordinary. So when I think about the governmental structure from a, you know, a, a Taiwanese standpoint, and I think about a military organization like West Point, and all, and all these countries have their own, you know, their, their versions of, of West Point. It's quite an extraordinary, you know, before I got into this space, I was really in corporate change management. Right, so we would just deal with really complex institutions, and we were all called sort of ethnographers of, of technology. And you you just take in data from participants in these these um, uh, micro organizations. It was still you know complex in their own right to figure out how you turn those ships you know one direction or the other. But um, he's navigating one that is. You know, just has a uh, more rigorous hierarchy than, than any other place that, that, that you could possibly imagine. So it's, again, the, the collection that, that, this, that, that these volumes are providing is, um, is a bit mind blowing. I even think about, I'm not, I'm not sure that, that one could fully digest what you all are doing at once. Um, uh, so again, hats, hats off to everyone, but you know, also just hats off to you, Colette, really, I'm, uh, I'm excited. I don't know what else to say. I'm excited. No, it, it is exciting. Celeste Brevard, who is a um, graduate of, um, well, who is, is going to be graduating from New York University. <laughs> I wish she will soon be a graduate of New York University. Uh, she's currently uh, engaged in writing her thesis. She has a question. Go ahead, Celeste, please. Yeah, thank you, and thanks to everybody for coming. My question is essentially just after hearing all of this, do you, any of the panelists have guidance as to how they think change can be affected by the populace in a democracy? Would it be from the consumer perspective of trying to um, sort of control what corporations are doing through their purchasing and through the economic track, or do we think it's going to be more through the civilian track and policy. I, oh, James, I go ahead, Jim. Yeah. 
So just as a, um, I guess a, a politician these days is at least how I come up on Google, which I didn't used to. I used to come up as an author instead of politician, but I, I would say it, it really requires trying to boil the ocean for lack of better phrases. And uh, things like what we're doing here in academia and via this, this book series is trying to implement considerations for data collection into the political lexicon. But at the same time, and again, we did a poor job of it earlier today, but we're gonna re-release all of the videos from earlier today. There are a lot of actors in corporate spaces to compel them to be, again, different actors uh, with regards to how they identify and distribute information around uh, individuals' identities. And not only individuals' identities, but also uh, the broader community's uh, identities. I can't stress enough how uh, the, the very next book coming in this series is doing a really great job. I mean, it's a, it's a long, it's a lot of, it's a lot of language. It's a thick book. <laughs> it's not necessarily, at least I wouldn't say an, an, an easy, an easy read, but if you, you understand what they're doing, they're sort of transforming what we would normally consider to be human rights into this sort of communal or web rights. And it's really based on a few, uh, uh, philosophical conundrums, like the idea that um, if, if any of you are born, especially in the United States, your mother's date of birth, your mother's identity is required on your birth certificate to identify you as a, as a person, right? So you have to be witnessed into existence, existence, excuse me, from a data standpoint. Funny enough, your father's information is not necessary <laughs> for that. But as your mother's date of birth is your personal data, it is also her date of birth, which makes it her personal data. And you, as a, 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 an entity with agency, sort of a, a sovereign person, you are still really just a derivative in or a representation of this broader community that you come from. And that fact is uh, what we hope will influence how institutions, meaning two or more individuals, understand their ability to interact with all of us in an ethical and equitable way going forward. I really think that this particular issue is, to, to round it off and, and try at least to answer your question, is the most significant issue in us providing not only agency over what happens with institutions making decisions about our lives or, or compelling us to make decisions about our own lives, uh, but also then spreading the, the value that proliferates from our interactions on behalf of our lives. I feel like that was a, a bit of a clunky statement, but uh, the answer to your question is, is it's, it's twofold. We have to have a, a series of activism interacting with corporate world, right? Or private, privately owned institutions and how they distribute stakes in those privately owned institutions, meaning stakes around equity and agency. And then we have to have a certain amount of activism campaigning around what it means to be an individual participating in this broader community. And so per what I like to call inclusionism or what we're calling inclusionism for this book series, the, the most uh, small quote that I can find that, that makes it relevant is the idea that individuals are at their best when they identify with the community. I think we're all experiencing that right now. But communities are only at their best when they identify all of their individuals. And what it requires is this sort of dynamism in constantly having you identify yourselves and us acknowledging that identification of yourselves. And we have to sort of endeavor to create more and more comfortable environments for you to come out as whatever you are. Even if it is something that is, and this is the, the, I think, dangerous part of it, even if it is something that is um, in conflict with other folks' very being. I feel like even what we're seeing, and I'll make this slightly political for two seconds, in Donald Trump's America, is the coming out, to use a more sort of term using the LGBT space, of bigots in, in this time. And while on one hand, it's, it's scary, and something that requires, I think for some of us at least, some very real opposition. 
On the other hand, uh, I would say it is, it is necessary. It is high time. And it may actually, if we can muster the leadership to guide us through it, provide us with an opportunity to facilitate uh, more tolerance and eventually more acceptance. But it all goes back to, I think, with this course and this, um, this uh, professional domain is about in IR, which is that leadership is a commodity that you cannot automate and or replace. Uh, you have to have a sort of empathetic, uh, spiritual almost, uh, theoretical approach to, to how and why individuals should get to exist in the communities that they, uh, that they come from and that they're eventually going to create later. So we got to do both. Oh, and, and go ahead, Jerry. You talking to me? Yeah. Okay. No, and, I was just and Hollyfield. Oh, okay. Just on, briefly on, on an optimistic um, response to Celeste's question is I think that, and to what James was just saying, I, I think there is good evidence that the activism of voters and citizens makes a difference. California passed a much more restrictive data privacy law than any other state in the country has. Obviously, the EU passed the GDPR. And both of those are having a very real impact on the world of technology. For example, uh, by 2022, I think it is, or 2023, the use of cookies will be eliminated pretty much globally by most major tech firms because of the California and the GD rules and the GDPRs. But as, as Zayed was saying earlier, one of the problems that we face is that there are so many ways that we can get around things like the anonymization of data by aggregating data um, sets so that we can take anonymous data and identify not only that the name address of the household, but also the person in the household who, for example, um, was able to be identified through six Google searches, just six anonymous Google searches. CNN was able to identify the person in a particular household in a particular city at a particular address based on those six searches. So this is a problem that is not going to go away. Activism, active activism is going to make a difference, but it's not, we're not going to be able to stop because technology will be one step ahead of us and one step ahead of um, policy and regulation, as I had said. Andrea, go ahead, Jer. I was just going to say that, you know, what this, what this says to me, um, and I'm using a legal lens, is that, you know, our definition of privacy has going to have to, to, to be rethought because if, in fact, um, you know, what James was saying about um, community and the linkages between individuals and if community becomes the, the, the unit of study, then, then privacy, the way we have originally imagined it, maybe it needs um, to be looked at differently. And um, uh, one of the things that I have um, been working on is, you know, what is the expectation of privacy for individuals now in, in, in this world? Um, bases uh, versus you know what people expected before, and I think that um, looking at that differently and and demanding it be the way it needs to be for some purposes and maybe um, relaxed for other purposes um, might be an interesting way of thinking about it. Okay, James, I am cognizant now that we're at three twenty-five, and I, I want go. you to have time to transition to your next yeah. panel. Thank you to those who've stayed on. Uh, Ivory, particularly right. from Indonesia, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Great session. Back to you, James. All the best. Thank you. And is that part of this? Like, is that, can we be in that or is that something separate? Uh, James, I think you, if well, that, we come back to this separate. room, what happens? <laughs> yeah, it, it's separate, yeah. Okay, all right, it'll cool. On, get uh, it on the live stream or what? Live stream, it'll be on the live on stream. The live stream? Okay, yeah. we'll do. Okay. Thanks so okay. much. Cool. Anne, thank you. We'll be in thank touch, dear. Thank, thank you, Sarah. So Diamond, thank you for staying on. Take care.